Good evening. Welcome to the March meeting of the Greenwich Representative Town Meeting. My name is Tom Byrne, RTM moderator. As all members have received a copy of the call for tonight's meeting, the reading of the call will be omitted. Will everyone please rise and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As all members have received a copy of the minutes of our January 19 meeting, the reading of those minutes will be omitted. Uh, we do have one change in the reference to um, our National Guard member. Uh, we're gonna change the first name from Edward to Eduardo to make that accurate. Are there any other proposed changes to the uh, minutes? Hearing none, the minutes with that one amendment stand adopted upon unanimous consent. I did, uh, well, our moderator pro tem, Alexis Volgaris did send out the uh, suggested organization for our agenda tonight. Um, and that is to put on our consent calendar items three and five through 15, all of the appointments along with item three. Um, and that would leave to consider separately items one, two, four, and 16. Um, before I get to the consent calendar items, um, I do want to first welcome those who are joining us uh, this month at Town Hall. Of course, we have our moderator pro tem who makes this all happen, Alexis Volgaris. We have our assistant town clerk who also makes it all happen 24-7, Kimberly Spisano. We have our tech team, Jenny Larkin and Craig Jones. And then we are joined tonight by um, several of our committee chairs and district tabulators. We have Jude Collins, the district tabulator for District 10. We have uh, Catherine Lavalbo, who is chair of Parks and Recreation, member of District 2. We have Kimberly Salib, chair of Transportation, Michael Spilo, chair of Public Works, Lucia Jansen, chair of BOC. Richard Newman, Chair of Transportation, and Michael Basham, Chair of Finance. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have some in-person contact. I thought we might queue up that we're having a party on the, the music list, but we have a lot of business to do. There are many, many uh, interested speakers. Um, the total was over 100 who have signed up to speak on various items tonight. So let us get down to business. And um, in order to manage within a reasonable time, I will recognize Stephen Rubin of District 3 to offer a motion to limit debate. Stephen Rubin, District 3. Yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to make a motion to lim limit the principal and the, propo the, the principal proponent and opponent speakers to five minutes and all other speakers to two minutes. Now, is that per item, meaning if there are motions that are raised regarding those items, they would only have two minutes total, or is that two minutes per motion? Let's go two minutes per motion. All right, is there a second to that motion? It has been moved and seconded to limit debate to two minutes per motion per speaker, with the exception that the proponent and the principal opponent presumably uh, the latter to be determined by the moderator, would have up to five minutes. Um, that a motion to limit debate is not itself debatable and requires a two thirds majority to pass. I will in the first instance uh, call for a raised hand vote. Um, if it is close, we'll take a record vote if necessary. Um, so at this, at this point, um, all hands down. And I will call upon all those in favor of limiting debate as described to please raise your hand. Now, 
and only members are voting, of course. Um, all right, so I have 139. That doesn't include me. I'll, I'll also vote 140. All right, let's put all those hands down. Um, <clears throat> all those opposed to limiting debate as described, please raise your hand. So somewhere in the 21, 22 range. So approximately 140 to 22, uh, that motion has carried by a two thirds vote. All right, um, that brings us to the call of tonight's meeting. As I said, the recommendation was to combine items three and five through 15 for voting purposes. So at this point, I will designate those items for our consent calendar. If they remain on the consent calendar, the only thing we will hear tonight is what I am about to say, as we do not um, hear committee reports or have discussion on consent calendar items. All right, so the first, the first consent calendar item, now there are two substitute resolutions. Uh, in order to to um, reserve time for the contested issues, we have decided that we, we can put substitute resolutions um, on the consent calendar. So item three is a substitute resolution. I will read it. Resolved that the RTM approves the grant of an easement from the town of Greenwich to Connecticut Light and Power Company doing business as Eversource Energy for property located at 451 Steamboat Road for the purpose of providing upgraded electric service for the police pistol range located at 451 Steamboat Road. Be it further resolved that the first selectman is hereby authorized to execute such an easement on behalf of the town of Greenwich in substantially similar form as presented to the RTM, that being the addition and the substitute. Item five, so I'm designating that substitute for item three. I'm also designating this substitute resolution for item five. Um, which merely changes the term expiration date from uh, 2025 to 2022. This is the appointment of Donna Joffrey to be a regular member of the Alarms Appeals Board with a term expiring June 30, 2022. Item six is a resolution appointing Peter Linderoth to be an alternate member of Inland Wetlands and Watercourses One Word Agency for a term expiring October 31, 2024. Item seven, the appointment of Sue Botson to be a regular member of the Board of Parks and Recreation for a term expiring June 30, 2024. Item eight is a resolution appointing Joel Muehlbaum to be a regular member of the Board of Health for a term expiring June 30, 2025. Item nine, also a substitute. Uh, this is the appointment of William Galvin to be a regular member of Inland Wetlands and Watercourses One Word Agency for a term expiring October 31, 2022. Item 10, the appointment of Paul Hopper to be a regular member of Nathaniel Witherell Board for a term expiring June 30, 2023. Item 11, the appointment of Michael Van Oss to be a regular member of the Harbor Management Commission for a term expiring March 31, 2024. Item 12, the appointment of Philip James Dodd to be an alternate member of the Historic District Commission for a term expiring October 31, 2025. Item 13 is the appointment of Debbie Applebaum to be a regular member of the Board of Human Services for a term expiring June 30, 2022. Item 14, the appointment of Jillian Ingram or Ingraham to be a regular member of the Board of Human Services for a term expiring June 30, 2023. Item 15, 
is the appointment of Tara Spice Rastiri to be a regular member of the Board of Human Services for a term expiring June 30, 2022. So those are the items I am designating uh, for our consent calendar. Pursuant to our rules, if um, a member objects, the member is entitled to three minutes to express reasons for the objection. Is there any objection to the designation of any of those items to our consent calendar? Hearing no objections, will our district tabulators please mark your voting cards, consent calendar items three and five through 15. We will start the five minute clock and await the expiration of that time before proceeding further. All right, that is the end of our five minute uh, period for voting on those consent calendar items. We do not yet have a result, but we are going to continue with the next item of business, which brings us to the first of the separate items. By the way, it's approximately 817. We have disposed of 75% of our agenda. Wow, at that rate, we're almost done. All right, um, so item number one, this is a, a second reading of the sense of the meeting resolution on the police on Greenwich Avenue. It is in the same form uh, that it was in January, so it does not need to be presented. It is currently before us. Um, may we have the reports of the committees that considered item number one, beginning with Lucia Jansen, chair of our budget overview committee. The Budget Overview Committee discussed the SOMAR in the full context it was presented by the first selectman in last year's fiscal year 21 budget. The removal of three police traffic officers on Greenwich Avenue was to have a reoccurring annual operating savings of 270,000 to 400,000, including employee benefits. The operating savings were to be applied to capital project improvements on Greenwich Avenue beginning with two intersections. One Greenwich Avenue intersection described was West Elm Street, and the other intersection was the larger Havemeyer and Arch Street. The cost for the two intersections was to be $200,000. During budget deliberations, the BET expressed deep concern with the loss of traffic police on the avenue and to the lack of details with the Greenwich Avenue intersection improvements. Ultimately, the BET restored the funds for the return of the three traffic police officers on Greenwich Avenue. They also added a condition requesting a traffic study, as well as a detailed breakdown of costs for the two intersection improvements. The BOC learned in our discussion with the first read that the three traffic police at the two intersections had been permanently removed and were redeployed to other functions on Greenwich Avenue. The BOC discussed that we are in a rare and temporary situation and does not represent the normal conditions on Greenwich Avenue with busy vehicular and pedestrian traffic. The employee savings from the headcount reduction no longer applied. The BOC also discussed that the first selectman had returned to the BET for release of the condition for the two Greenwich Avenue intersection improvements. The BET was informed the project cost was no longer 200,000, but had risen to 300,000. The scope of the project was also cut in half to one intersection at West Elm Street and did not include the Havemeyer Arch Street intersection. There were going to be four parking spot losses impacting resident convenience and revenue from the metered spots. Despite the vastly reduced scope and increased costs, 
the BET voted 921 to release the condition and accept the project. The BOC also discussed the fiscal year 2022 budget, which interestingly had the remaining Havemeyer Arch intersection, but this time at a new cost of 750,000. Another $500,000 cost was included for drainage, streetscape and repaving implementation. Also, uh, a new Greenwich Avenue project for concrete barriers of 250,000 that could possibly remove up to 60 parking spaces. No artistic rendering has been provided for any of these Greenwich Avenue improvements. In our discussion, many BOC members expressed concern that there was no comprehensive plan for the wide ranging significant changes that's being proposed. Many committee members who frequent the avenue believe that the normally busy four-way stop signs, particularly at Havemeyer and Arch, are insufficient for the diverse population of elderly, the young, new, or visiting residents to Greenwich. And the town could be exposing itself to claims of insufficient traffic control. Despite this, some felt that it is the first selectman's and the chief of police job to decide how to deploy police resources. Other members are open to changes on Greenwich Avenue, but do not want to see the current situation changed until there is a comprehensive alternative plan for Greenwich Avenue. The BOC vote was 840. The SOMAR passed. District 4, 5, 6, and 9 voted no. Thank you. Thank you. All right, before I continue with the reports on item one, I'm, I do have the result of the vote on our consent calendar items. Those were items three and five through 15. Those in favor, 214, opposed zero, abstaining one. The consent calendar items have carried. Our next report uh, will be given by Michael Basham, chair of our finance committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the first selectman, Fred Camillo, presented to us uh, when we took this up on its first read. We had Chief Heavey, the first selectman, was unable to attend. Uh, he talked uh, extensively about uh, redeploying the, the benefits of redeploying police to stop criminal activity on the avenue versus being confined strictly to just directing traffic. He also mentioned that there had, uh, during the eight or nine years, that there had not been a policeman at the Lewis Street intersection, that uh, there had been no incidents of any kind that would suggest that there was a safety issue. Um, in the conversation, uh, he was asked if the officers would still be deployed on Arch Street, which is the busiest and by definition, probably the most dangerous intersection on Greenwich Avenue. Uh, to, and he said, yes, they would be there to direct traffic as needed. Uh, he was asked if it's possible that future circumstances merit retaining police at that intersection. Would he have any difficulty in recommending that? He said, no, he would not. A uh, number of questions were raised uh, about the cost of the bump outs. He did not have uh, specific numbers at that particular point in time. He said he would get those back to us. Additional uh, questions were raised about the number of parking places that were gonna be lost. Uh, he mentioned that the town is already exploring numerous options to address the situation, including leasing existing privately owned parking facilities for town use, providing import, uh, parking for employees off the avenue so they don't have to feed meters, and also the possible use of a free trolley system that would move people from uh, uh, parking lots uh, you know, to the avenue. Uh, there was some additional discussion about how the bump outs that he had proposed would improve pedestrian safety and ADA accessibility and would add sort of aesthetic improvements to the avenue. Alana Hines from District 1, also a, an alternate on finance, uh, presented on behalf of the uh, Somer, uh, she mentioned, she reiterated that the Somer was intended to indicate support for returning police to direct traffic. Uh, they were not, uh, and she was concerned that somehow these were, it would be perceived as being opposed to safety improvements on the avenue, including the bump outs. Uh, she also made it clear that it was not intended to either be, be criticism of the police or to have, or to have any uh, impact in terms of whether there were potential cost savings or, or the, the lack thereof on, on the town budget. Uh, she was pleased that the SOMER had elicited a great deal of discussion surrounding the issue of police directing traffic and the need for pedestrian and driver safety. Police Chief did join the meeting. He had presented to us once before on the first read. He re-emphasized the benefits of being able to redeploy officers to provide additional and greater safety to the downtown area. Uh, the Finance Committee voted one in favor, 11 opposed, and reemphasized the benefits of being able to reploy, 
offices on the avenue was their primary uh, their primary uh, um, reason for voting positively. I mean, excuse me, negatively. Thank you. With the Town Services Committee report, it's Chairman Richard Newman. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Town Services met two months in a row. Um, this month we had Ed Didakis representing uh, District 1 to present the item. Uh, James Heavey, Chief of Police, was also with us. Um, Ed pointed out in his comments um, that the purpose of this amendment is to return police to Greenwich Avenue, nothing more, nothing less. I guess there had been some concern that there was a, uh, this had to do with the bump outs. Um, Ed said that they, they really wanted to do this to start a discussion, which it definitely has. He mentioned that 1,500 people have signed the petition. He mentioned that many of the people believe the chaos of Greenwich Avenue is eliminated by police directing traffic. Uh, they believe drivers and pedestrians now must fend for themselves. Um, Ed did mention the senior center members are in favor of returning officers to the uh, corner because they are scared to cross the street. I pointed out that the senior center has been closed since the officers were removed. So I assume that's an opinion and not a fact. Uh, Chief Heavey was asked by the committee if he had no budget constraints, uh, would he put officers back into the little white traffic circles as he likes to call them? The answer was no, he does not think it is an efficient or effective use of a sworn officer. Stop signs work all over town including on Greenwich Avenue before 9 a.m. in the morning and after five in the afternoon and all day Sunday. Um, if the RTM does not know, a state statute does not allow anyone except a sworn officer to direct traffic. So we can't hire someone else uh, at, at another level uh, to direct traffic at this time. It was pointed out that first selectman uh, Camillo did a lot for the fire department and uh, police safety while he was in Hartford. He must still have some contacts there. Maybe we can do something about that. Uh, we just discussed facts versus opinion. Lewis Street um, had the officer removed 12 years ago with no increase in accidents. The officers work nine to five, so they are not on duty while traffic is rushing to or was rushing to, or from the train station. Again, stop signs work. Sundays has the lowest incident of accidents and there are no officers on duty. There's a large, larger police presence on Greenwich Avenue now versus when we had two officers directing traffic. We have four bike patrol officers which work from seven in the morning to six in the evening, seven days a week. We have our two ARCA officers, which is the um, team that the chief put toge together, which is an organized retail crime group uh, that patrols the avenue. We also have a patrol car assigned to that, to that area. So we have seven officers on the street uh, most of the time. Chief Heavey doesn't want to be considered an opponent of this, of this SOMAR. He pointed out that the officers were reassigned during the pandemic to the overflowing parks responding to COVID emergencies or to the parks and responding to COVID emergencies. He said he should, he should have communicated this better. He does not, uh, he does assign traffic officers between Black Friday and New Year's Day. He also uh, assigns officers during the sale days in the summer. They're actually paid for by the Chamber of Commerce. Traffic officers can't leave their posts. Uh, while bike officers can move up and down the avenue dealing with parking problems and traffic. They often jump off their bikes to direct traffic. Um, the chairman and vice chairman of the Selectman's Committee for People with Disabilities supports the use of the bump outs at intersections. There has been some um, conflicting opinion, uh, uh, views on uh, what their opinion was. If you haven't used the crosswalk at Fawcett at, uh, Avenue to Griggs Street, you should all go see how easy it is and how easy it makes it to cross the street. Uh, Chief Heavey did say something that the most disturbing comment the chief, uh, or the most disturbing comment, I'm sorry, that I heard that evening was that the chief said that a vote for the Somer is like a vote of no confidence for him. He truly feels um, 
that we're putting him in a, in a funny position by, by, by bringing this summer. Uh, we discussed the 1,500 people who have signed the petition. From the emails and op-eds I've been reading, and many of the um, many of the people signing, including the store owners, believe we are discussing removing the officers from the avenue, not reassigning them to the off to the uh, to the avenue. They don't even they haven't realized that the officers have been gone for almost a year. Do they think we are removing the orca team? Do they think the bike patrol? Do they know? what they are signing the petition for, we're not sure. Um, a member who voted for the SOMER, a, a town services member, mentioned uh, the chief's needs, that the chief needs more flexibility with his personnel, directing traffic as part of that, but he should be able to assign a few hours per day, not the nine to five, six days a week that we're asking for, maybe somewhere in the middle. I did think we had a great discussion. I think everyone walked out of there with a new knowledge of what this, uh, what's happening. Uh, many of the votes that we took included comments of being on the fence. We, at the end, we voted five in favor, six against, and one abstaining, so the motion failed. Districts one, two, seven, nine, and 10 voted yes. Voted uh, uh, districts three, four, five, eight, 11, and 12 voted no, and District 6 abstained. Thank you. Thank you. And with the report of our Transportation Committee, it's Chair Kimberly Salib. To discuss item one, the SOMA regarding reinstating the police presence on Greenwich Avenue to direct traffic. First Selectman Fred Camillo attended and discussed the rationale for why police were removed from those crosswalk duties. Originally, it was thought it would save money, but the police officers are still on duty now, patrolling Greenwich Avenue on foot and bike and directing traffic on, and directing uh, traffic on an as needed basis. He outlined why the police presence in his, in his judgment was sufficient to monitor public welfare um, and theft, fraud and crime on the avenue. He acknowledged the Arch Street intersection can uh, be at times very busy and mentioned that police uh, could still be taken off their avenue patrols and sent to the intersection to direct traffic and pedestrians as needed and as directed by police management. He highlighted the plan to install uh, permanent crossing uh, bump outs to protect safety in the absence of uh, police presence. The committee discussed a range of questions, including why police can't patrol and also direct traffic. Questions were also raised around the loss of um, parking uh, by the planned bump outs. And members also wondered why we could not have traffic um, employees who are not officers direct traffic on the avenue instead. Uh, members debated whether a stoplight would be more, more effective than the bump outs. And members also uh, discussed the town uh, reputation and tradition of having police direct traffic. After questions to Mr. Camillo, to First Selectman Camillo, the committee uh, met separately um, on the issues raised and uh, we took a vote. We had a tie vote. Uh, six districts voted yes uh, to return the police officers to traffic duty. Districts one, two, five, seven, eight, and 10 voted yes, and six districts voted uh, no. Districts three, four, six, nine, 11, and 12. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more committee report, that of our Public Works Committee, Michael Spilo, Chair of Public Works. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Public Works took up item one by unanimous consent on a motion for from Arlene Lamazo. 
We discussed changes to the Elm Street interse intersection and future intersection bump outs and several members voiced support for these uh, safety enhancements while others felt the loss of parking spots and the narrowing of the intersection were problematic. Uh, several members thought there should be a single comprehensive avenue streetscape project rather than uh, a piecemeal and uh, members were unhappy with the idea of a trolley uh, as a solution to parking. Um, a member of the committee pointed out that the issue of police is not related to the intersection renovation and the police could be retained even after the intersection is redesigned because the width of the traffic lanes will not change. Uh, the issue of neighborhood safety was also raised. Some felt police presence improved safety while others, while others did not. A newcomers to town felt the police were rude and barked commands at uh, uh, pedestrians. Uh, we voted 271 on the motion with a no votes indicating they felt the police were better deployed elsewhere. And um, the abstention was unsure about the issue. Thank you. That concludes our committee reports. Um, we will now have discussion on item one. Let me uh, remind everyone that we do have a limit on debate of two minutes per speaker promotion. Um, I will announce uh, who has the floor and who is following that individual. And uh, those who are attendees need would it would help us if you could raise your hand uh, when your name is called so that we can find you easily and, uh, and allow you to have the floor when it is your turn. Um, I will also tell you that on this item, we have approximately 40 uh, individuals signed up to speak. So um, it certainly would uh, be okay if a prior speaker has made the points that uh, you intended to make that you could simply indicate that you, you adopt the, those same remarks. Um, it is certainly acceptable to pass when called. So let us begin. Um, Alana Hines of District 1 is recognized as the, as the proponent of this and has up to five minutes. Alana Hines. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, thank you for all the great discussion and, um, you know, we're really uh, thrilled that this, um, this SOMER has brought forth what we were hoping, which is really a community discussion around what we feel is a very important issue. Um, there's been robust discourse. We've heard a lot about different improvements planned for the avenue, the changes that have been made to the policing, um, policing on the avenue. And most importantly, we were really happy to hear from our constituents. Um, I also wanna take this time to, to recognize that we really appreciate the time and response from both the first selectman and Chief Heavey who have participated in many discussions on this and I think have responded with a lot of great information and really um, brought a lot of good information to our discussions. Um, you know, as you may have heard from some of the committee reports, we did wanna highlight just clearly um, the SOMER is, is purely about the directing of traffic on Greenwich Avenue and the important um, safety benefits we believe this brings to pedestrians and drivers. Um, it is not against other avenue improvements, um, nor all the parking challenges we all, we all live with. Um, as you've heard, there are lots of plans in place for um, various improvements to Greenwich Avenue and various ways to address um, the ongoing challenge we have with parking in the downtown area. So this is um, not, you know, to speak against any of those, those plans. Um, you know, we also did want to highlight this, you know, we viewed this as um, an emphasis of, of the value people place on the visible presence of, of the police directing traffic um, on the avenue in those locations where we've all come to appreciate their help as we, as we try to navigate the, the traffic. Um, but, you know, we do recognize and appreciate all the response we've seen from Chief Heavey about how he has been effectively redeploying those resources. Um, to that end, I did want to note that there will be an amendment coming forth that um, updates the language of the SOMER. I won't uh, read the language here, but um, it does address some of the challenges of using, you know, highly trained police to direct traffic and seeks to endorse uh, support for um, exploring other options to provide this service. 
uh, just, to, just to be clear, the proponents of the SOMER are supportive of that amendment. So when you hear that, um, understand that's part of our, um, we have had discussions and believe that is, that is a positive amendment. Um, you know, I think many good topics have been raised as we've, as we've talked about this, and we've heard personally from many D1 constituents in addition to the responses that we've heard about from the survey. So we have had a lot of inbound discussion within our district and anecdotally heard other districts as well have um, received a lot of community support for um, returning the police to direct traffic or, you know, as we've said, the amendment may address other options for that. Um, you know, I don't want to belabor the point. We have a long discussion ahead of us, but, you know, our main concern is and remains pedestrian and driver safety. We, we really are just hoping to make sure that we have a strong dialogue and strong solutions around achieving that objective and making sure that the avenue continues to remain um, a safe and vibrant place for everyone to, to enjoy in Greenwich and for all our various constituents, many of whom who have been named tonight in terms of the elderly or young or visitors, all of whom we want to encourage to come and enjoy Greenwich Avenue and make it um, a great downtown location for all of us. So we appreciate all the discussion. Um, we appreciate all the time people have spent on this. Uh, we hope that it's clear that we are not against a lot of the wonderful planned improvements. I personally think the bump outs, this is on my, my point, will be um, uh, a nice addition, but I don't think these are mutually exclusive solutions. So um, look forward to, to hearing the discussion that comes out tonight. Thank you again for the time and support for this summer and um, happy voting. <laughs> Thank you everyone. All right, our next speaker will be our first selectman, Fred Camillo. But before I call upon Mr. Camillo, um, I want to acknowledge that, as, as the prior speaker mentioned, there is a motion to amend that we just learned about. Um, and there was no um, speaker sign up list for it. So um, I think what makes sense is we will, I will call upon all who want to speak on item one, and then we'll take up the uh, motion to amend. So if, if, if when you're called, you have some, if you think you want to say something about the motion to amend, um, well, you may not even know what it is, but um, I think it makes more sense to go through the speaker list and then we'll, we'll take up the motion to amend, which, which talks about waiting until after the pandemic is over and trying to um, <clears throat> get the authority to use non-police personnel to do traffic on the avenue. All right, um, our next speaker is Fred Camillo. Um, and our, again, I remind all speakers now until the end when Chief Heavey will be the uh, principal opponent, have two minutes, Mr. Camillo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to address you all tonight. Um, I just want to say that uh, to the people who brought the SOMER, I certainly respect where you're coming from. I don't think there's that much that separates us really at the end of the day. Um, but I know you're coming at it from a good place. And certainly I really respect uh, Alana's uh, presentation um, tonight and, and, and the previous weeks and months. Um, I certainly have counted myself in that camp for many years. Uh, but over the years, I've listen to people, uh, mainly our law enforcement professionals who have said there is a better way to police and protect our public. The past 11 months have shown that is exactly what has happened. Um, you'll hear tonight from a few police officers and Chief Evie who will tell you that more crime uh, criminals have been apprehended, more crime has been deterred since we started this uh, last spring uh, than in recent memory. Um, and certainly the, the bump outs, which keep coming out, will be a 24 seven public safety enhancement, 24 seven. In the past, we only had officers at those intersections for seven hours a day. And we know from a DPW study that after four o'clock, there is more pedestrian traffic than ever before, but it was never an issue after four o'clock, it was never an issue on the, on the weekends. So we know, and there hasn't been any issues since last year, so we know that's not an issue, but we wanna be safe rather than sorry. The bump outs will not only uh, provide a, you know, an aesthetic enhancement to the avenue, very much so, but uh, really do provide enhanced security. 
Um, it does shorten up the, uh, the sight lines. It shortens up, cars do have to stop uh, a little quicker. Um, it's gotten the strong endorsement of the uh, for Selectman's Committee on People with Disabilities. And uh, the more people, we're getting a lot more support now as we see a mobile unit out there. They're not just stationed to a corner directing traffic. That's a, a terrible waste of, of great talent there. And, and these guys are in great shape. They're, they come around this uh, town hall a couple of days a week just checking on us on those bikes. But they're, they're a, there's a bike unit. They're walking the beat. There is, as you heard, an undercover unit there. They're doing great work. Mr. Kello, if you could wrap it up. Um, we, we've exceeded the two minutes, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, I appreciate your your uh, your consideration of this and uh, look forward to the debate. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. I think there's some confusion in the room. The, the five minutes is going to go to Chief Beebe. Now, um, if, if someone wants to move to extend the limit for a particular individual, that, that is in order, but require two thirds of that as well. All right, so our next, of course, I, I neglected to do what I said I was gonna do. Our next speaker will be Nancy Burke to be followed by Lucy Krasner. Uh, thank you, good evening. Um, I'm Nancy Burke, member of district two in the RTM and on the budget overview committee. And I'm also a 2016 graduate of the Citizens Police Academy. So I greatly respect our Greenwich Police Force and I'm speaking in favor of this resolution. And I also would be speaking in, had we, had we handled this a little differently, I'd be speaking on the amendment, amendment as well to restore officers to the intersections of Greenwich Avenue. We here in Greenwich are fortunate to have a police force which is fully funded. Both the RTM and the BET have previously voted to keep officers on Greenwich Avenue, and the BET has kept this item in the budget every year with good reason. And this past year, it's now up to 1,609 residents have signed an online petition in favor of restoring policemen to the intersections. And as the pandemic lifts and regular traffic continues to build up in our main shopping and restaurant district, I see no reason not to keep officers at the intersections to maintain traffic flow and to protect pedestrians and motorists. Safety should be our highest priority. Safety, safety for the young who dart in and out of the intersections, safety for the elderly who will be making their way slowly across the intersection from the Muse to the Senior Center and elsewhere and safety for the motorists looking every which way at intersections for other cars. For now, skateboarders, yes, skateboarders are back and I understand they've been zooming down without stopping right straight down Greenwich Avenue. And I, hear, I heard that today from someone who works at a store there and sees everything. Um, and now we have officers on bikes uh, and you have to watch out for them. All right, thank you, thank you very much. If, if speakers want, I can give a warning, but we do have the, the clock on the screen. So speakers should be monitoring their two minute time on the screen. Uh, Lucy Krasner to be followed by Ed Dodakis. Uh, I'll be very brief. I, I used to think that the police on the avenue were wonderful and I was very surprised when they, uh, I thought that they were no longer there. But having heard Chief Heavey uh, speak to the flexibility of using our police force in a better fashion, I believe we should not micromanage our police force and we should let him decide the best way to keep us safe. And I firmly think we should vote this Somar down and let the chief decide how the police should be deployed to keep us safe. Thank you. Ed Dodakis to be followed by Terry Betteridge. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, members of the town meeting. Uh, this item has certainly sparked the community discussion we hoped it would. Discussions are occurring all over town there are letters, op-eds, concerns raised by merchants, and an online petition signed by 1,600 declaring their support for police directing Greenwich Avenue traffic. The passion of so many townspeople is evident. It's not surprising. After all, 
police directing traffic shows we value protecting residents and visitors and is an iconic symbol of our town. Yet the last thing any RTM member wants is to decide deployment of police resources. I agree. But police directing avenue traffic is completely different. These officers are highly visible and interactive with our residents. When we propose to remove them, we should be considering those affected by it. Now, I love the RTM because we are the voices for those in our districts. We don't represent the powerful or the politicians, we represent the people. 1,600 petition signatures is compelling, especially knowing that each signer had to search out for the petition. Assuming 41,000 adults in town, the 1,600 signers equates to 4%. That's significant. Those folks want their voices heard. And ladies and gentlemen of the RTM, you are their voices. Once debate ends tonight, one true fact will remain. Regardless of how many bump outs we build, regardless of how many cops are riding bikes, this plan leaves pedestrians to fend for themselves. In communities across America, there are arguments to reduce police engagement. Yet here in Greenwich, we have an animated discussion about how much we appreciate and value the police. That's pretty darn good. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Terry Betteridge to be followed by Carol Zarilli. All right, we don't see Terry Betteridge. Again, please, uh, when your name is called, as soon as it's called as the on-deck speaker, raise your hand so we can locate you among the uh, attendees. So Carol Zarilli is up to be followed by Carl Higby. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, this is Carol Zarelli. Um, I'm speaking in favor of um, returning the police to the avenue. I'm not going to belabor because others have already said what I what said my feelings, and um, we'll see how it goes with the um, with the uh, change of language. Thank you. Thank you, Carl Higby, to be followed by Alyssa Kalishian. Hey, I appreciate it, uh, folks out there. Uh, so one of the things is I'm not for or against cops. I am not, uh, you know, for or against bump outs. I just think in general, SOMERS are really dumb. It's like a strongly worded letter from the UN that doesn't really mean anything. But I can tell you one thing I do trust is that our law enforcement knows what the best thing to do here is. And I think it's a bad practice for the RTM, many of which have never experienced any type of law enforcement with notable exceptions here to try to weigh in on what Chief Heavey and Fred Camillo have discussed about, probably based on statistics and data. So I would just defer and support whatever Chief Heavey believes is safest for Greenwich residents. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa Kalishian to be followed by Browen Rockefeller. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Kalishian. Can you hear me? And I'm a lifelong resident of Greenwich and a commercial property owner on Greenwich Avenue. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Selectman Camillo, Chief Heavey and the members of the RTM. I am speaking out against the proposal to remove police from the Avenue corners. COVID has brought new residents to town and they really didn't come here because they were moving to Greenwich as their dream location. They came to escape New York and they brought the rat race mentality with them. Like the culture in Manhattan, they speed down Greenwich Avenue. They're less courteous, less cautious, and don't know how to navigate our three-way intersections. I am deeply concerned about the danger for my children who walk the avenue, where parents have always felt relieved that the cops at their posts, not on bikes, would control the traffic, cross them safely, and whose very presence remind drivers to watch for pedestrians. Our aging population, like my mother, 
walk a little slower and need assistance, now need to figure out how to make eye contact with all three drivers in the intersection so they don't get hit. Have you ever tried to walk across the street from the senior center to the board of ed without a cop to help you? The cop corners act as our first line of defense, visual defense against theft. Doesn't the re recent increase in downtown crime make you question the timing of the removal of these cops? It is no coincidence. And when we say that there's no, been no pedestrian safety issues since the last year, let's remember our stores were closed and our shoppers stayed away from the downtown. Lastly, the cops demonstrate what sets Greenwich apart, who we are as a community, it's the first thing our visitors see, and it shows how warm and welcoming Greenwich is. I think my time is up, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our next speaker is, uh, and again, I apologize for any mispronunciation, Browen Rockefeller. We don't see the name on our list. Um, I'll remind anyone, if they happen to be calling in to get our attention, you can hit star nine, and then we can verify who that is. So um, if, if there's no Browen Rockefeller, the next speaker is Valentina Pagosian, to be followed by Sam Romeo. No Valentina? No. Sam Romeo, to be followed by Tyler Pratt. Hello? Okay, you're on. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I've uh, had several conversations with the chief and the first selectman about this. I've gone over statistics. I spent a lot of time traveling through that intersection. And uh, for the past year, uh, originally I thought it would be a problem. But after monitoring it closely, I see no problem with removing the officers and having a better deployment of uh, resources for the town of Greenwich. Uh, it's been proven that uh, the officers on the bikes do a much better job of policing. And I have complete confidence in our, our police chief. And uh, I would leave it up to him because after all, he's the uh, uh, top cop in the town to uh, serve and protect us. And I trust his judgment. So I won't belabor the issue, but I'm uh, in favor of uh, keeping the officers off the avenue. Thank you. Tyler Pratt to be followed by Joan Stewart. You need to unmute Tyler Pratt. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Tyler. I'm, I'm uh, born and raised in Greenwich and I still live here. Uh, by having the police on Greenwich Avenue, it creates a sense of security, not only for pedestrians, but also for all the businesses on and off the avenue. I observe that there are more distractions and increased chances of accidents with the barriers set up for outdoor dining, not only for drivers, but trying to park, but also for the pedestrians as well. And I also see more congestion and traffic in light of what's going on, coping with the COVID situation. I think we are having so many people coming in from New York and they're driving way too fast and aggressively, uh, driving like they're, they're like living in Manhattan and they're not obeying the law. So tempers are going to flare during these stressful, stressful times. And I believe we need the police present if things escalate. So I'm strongly in favor of getting the police back on the avenue directing traffic. And that, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Joan Stewart to be followed by Leslie Patrick. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. My name is Joan Stewart and live in District 1 since 1967. My father chose to move his family to Greenwich for three reasons, the school system, the beautiful stone walls, and the police on Greenwich Avenue. I vividly remember him saying that when I was a young girl. I feel that without the police on the avenue, it is increasingly dangerous for pedestrians 
especially at the intersection at Starbucks and the senior center. People roll through the stop sign, some don't stop, and it is very dangerous for those crossing the street with young children or their dog. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie Patrick to be followed by Mark Zuccarella. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Leslie Petrick, and I wanted to thank the RTM for all they do in this town and to keep it running smoothly. I also grew up in this town, as did both my parents, and my mother served on the RTM in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and about this issue of the policing on the avenue, I don't know why this issue keeps coming up. It's been a longstanding tradition in our town. And I've yet to meet anyone who says, I want to get rid of the police on the avenue. And I was thinking, why does this topic keep coming up? And I've, there are two reasons. The main one is it sounds like the police don't want to do it. And that would be fine if the town could hire our own security guards to man these posts. But I've heard that the police contracts forbid this. There's something reassuring about knowing that these officers are manning these posts. And I'm the on the avenue all the time, and it's unnerving not to have them around. Supposedly, they're now policing by riding their bikes up and down the avenue, but I'm there all the time, and I have yet to see this. And as a police officer, I would much prefer to be out riding my bike than standing directing traffic. But I think our taxpayer money is better spent with the officers stationed and directing traffic. And the other reason argued to remove uh, the police is the cost. And if we took them off the avenue, will we shrink our police force? The main reason to have them directing traffic is safety. And safety should be the first priority. And as others have pointed out, the Arch Street intersection, how dangerous that is. And also the discussion about these sidewalk bump outs, um, the first one going in at Elm Street intersection. And aside from taking down a beautiful oak tree and losing four parking spaces, has anyone questioned whether the plantings and maintenance of those plants has been budgeted? Thank you, um, thank you very much. That's the two minute mark. Uh, our next speaker is Mark Zuccarella to be followed by Laura Manelli. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Zuccarella. I'm the cap captain of the uh, patrol division from the Grass Police Department. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've been lis listening to everyone speak tonight and uh, as well as uh, just daily interactions with people. And just first we have, I just wanna say the officers are not being taken off of Greenwich Avenue. I, I've heard that more than one time this tonight. The officers are still on Greenwich Avenue and there's more officers on Greenwich Avenue in uniform and not in uniform. When we had the officers directing, when the officers are directing the corners, whether it be where the old way and Lewis have Meyer and Arch, there was only three officers on the avenue. The other officers are on their brakes. Uh, when we got rid of the Lewis Street and just manned Elm Street and have Meyer, there was only two officers on the avenue and given one time and they don't leave the circle. With the format that we're doing now, there is anywhere from four to seven officers working depending on the day. We added on schedules. So we have coverage on the avenue from Sunday to Saturday. So instead of having two officers directing traffic, there'll be four officers on a bike, two officers undercover in the retail stores addressing the shoplifting that we have seen an increase in the last couple of years. The main focus for the officers and the bikes are our Arch Street intersection with Habmeyer and Elm Street, as well as Lower Greenwich Avenue and Upper Greenwich Avenue. Their mobility allows them to get on back there. There are actually a lot of accidents that happen on Liberty Way more than sometimes on Greenwich Avenue in itself when people are looking for parking. Their, their ability to address all the, the motor vehicle violations that I've, I've been hearing tonight in between the intersection is are they're able to do while they're on their bikes was compared to when they're stuck in the circle, as we like to say. This is a more of effective and efficient, efficient use of, the, of the services to the town and we can address all the issues that everyone are bringing up tonight. All right, thank you very much. 
Laura Munelli to be followed by Susan Whitney. Two one, so we have a oh, phone number two one nine five. All right, you, are you able to? Okay. Uh, all right, well that's okay. We'll we'll go with Susan Whitney. Uh, are you there, Susan Whitney? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Are you Susan Whitney? My name is Susan Whitney. All right, I'm good. I'm a resident yeah. of Greenwich, living in District 1. I advocate for reinstating our Greenwich traffic police officers to their duties directing traffic on Greenwich Avenue for the safety and well-being of both our residents and visitors for the following reasons. It is a well-known fact that the sheer presence of uniformed police officers on the streets Directing traffic, as well as on foot patrol, maintains civic order and reduces crime. Two, when our traffic police officers are physically on the avenue, they can see firsthand the heartbeat of our town and report back to Central any irregularities. Three, traffic police officers on the avenue, specifically rookies, develop valuable interpersonal skills which they might not otherwise develop cruising in a patrol car. Also, this on-the-job training, so to speak, is at no additional expense to the taxpayers. Four, traffic police officers on the avenue are our goodwill ambassadors to both our residents and visitors. Five, traffic police officers on the avenue provide a valuable opportunity for residents to develop rapport and goodwill with each other, which they may not otherwise have. Residents, too, can express their concerns, which are done regularly with the traffic police officers. Six, traffic police officers on the avenue bring a sense of civility to our town, which sets us apart from other towns. Finally, seven, due to the opening of the street mall on Greenwich Avenue, there has been a tremendous influx of cars and pedestrians of late. Traveling Greenwich Avenue has become like a war, the Wild West. Specifically, traffic laws such as yielding to pedestrians, stopping at stop signs, driving while not on the phone or texting are blatantly being ignored. This non-compliance of state driving laws jeopardizes everyone's safety. For the affirmation reasons, please reinstate the traffic police officers to Greenwich Avenue. They are an asset to our town, both in terms of safety and quality. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Munelli to be followed by... Hillary McAtee. All right, no, we don't have a, a sign up for that. All right, do we have um, no Laura Manelli, you said? All right, how about uh, Hillary McAtee? And she will be. All right. And she'll be followed by Estelle Rufiak. So Hillary McAtee. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, I'm from uh, District 7 and my husband and I were raised in town and I am a fourth generation Greenwich resident. Growing up in Greenwich, I recall when Greenwich Avenue was a two way street. Parking was readily available and it was so safe we would leave our keys of ignition while we shopped. Unfortunately, today on Greenwich Avenue, we have congestion, theft, parking challenges, increased speed of cars and distracted drivers. So I really urge the town to return the police to Greenwich Avenue for crossing safety to help prevent the uh, theft and to add to the charm of Greenwich. I remain, thank you. Thank you. Estelle Rufiak to be followed by Michelle Richardson. We don't see a <clears throat> Estelle Rufiak. If you could raise your hand when your name is called to help us out. 
All right, um, how about Michelle Richardson? Do we have that? All right, to be followed by Peter Malkin. Hello. Yes, you're on. Hi, this is my first time doing this. So I am I just have a question. I wanted to speak on the Blight Houses. All right, Did then I that's the next that? item. That's the next item. Okay, so I'll pass for now, thank you. All right, thank you. Peter Malkin to be followed by Robert Smurlow. This is Peter Malkin, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, first I wanna say that I have great respect for the chief and the first selectman. Uh, I think the issue here is not so much uh, security from theft, but safety. Uh, as someone 87, uh, the wife in her 80s, we have found it difficult to get across the street even though during this period of pandemic, the traffic has been much lighter than usual. Uh, and the traffic on uh, Elm Street is substantially greater than it is on Lewis Street. So I think that uh, the, the lack of accidents during pandemic on Elm Street is not really the test that we need. Um, just yesterday, uh, we saw someone, uh, we were crossing on the south side of the street, he was crossing on the north side of the street. He got halfway across the street and a car from New York went zooming by uh, and uh, the car on, on his side had stopped. Uh, so we think that some kind of traffic direction would be very helpful here, whether it's police or some alternative form of direction uh, of someone capable of handling it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Robert Smurlow to be, <clears throat> to be followed by Heather Sargent. You need to unmute yourself. How's that? Good evening, Officer Robert Smurlow. I've uh, been working with the police department uh, for about 19 years. I'm currently assigned to the bike unit uh, where we have four officers assigned. Uh, when I first started with the police department, I was assigned to the Greenwich Avenue traffic detail. Uh, since the bike unit has been established, uh, we've been able to cover much more ground and do more actual policing. We are also able to respond to calls quicker and on a bike. Uh, when we the officers are standing in the traffic circle, our main focus is simply traffic direction. Uh, we have limited interaction with the public and merchants, and uh, we're not able to leave our posts, which means if we see something, we have to call it in, and doing that will waste some precious time, perhaps allowing more crimes to occur. Um, now that we are mobile on electric bikes, uh, we can respond to calls quickly and patrol more downtown Greenwich, uh, like the back alleys, parking lots, et cetera, uh, which we've never uh, been able to do before. Uh, we are now more approachable, and there's been a tremendous positive community response. Uh, Crime on the Avenue is down uh, because of our ability to work with the ORCA and to uh, cover the entire Greenwich Business District. And uh, we are still able to aid with traffic issues um, as we see fit. Thank you, Speaker. I'm sorry. Um, our next speaker is Heather Sargent to be followed by Thomas uh, Bonomo. Good evening. My name is Heather Sargent. I have lived in the town for a majority of my life. I have four children, one in lower school, one in middle school, one in upper school, and one in college. I'm also fortunate to have my parents who are in their 80s also reside in town. I am in favor of restoring the police presence at the traffic intersections. Over the last few years, I've seen more cars try to drive up the avenue than I have in the previous 40. As we all know, COVID created many new outdoor dining possibilities on Greenwich Avenue. And with an influx of new families, we have observed a large number of new teenagers and young drivers. I believe that removing the intersection traffic police does not address the needs created by these recent changes. Additionally, we are sadly living in a world where children are not allowed much freedom. Without a visible and consistent police presence on the avenue, I believe that the safety of children walking from the top of the avenue to the bottom of the avenue, just like I did in the 70s and 80s, will diminish. 
I thought we wanted to bring more people to the downtown, not drive us all away due to the lack of safety for our families. While I understand the limitations created by police standing at the middle of the street, I feel firmly that the visible, polite, confident presence of police create a safe and unique environment on the avenue. Intersection police are part of the history and tradition of Greenwich and provide a crucial and valuable public service. Many thanks. And I'd also like to adopt the words that were spoken by Su uh, Susan Whitney before. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, uh, Thomas Bonomo to be followed by Ren Harmon. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, members of the RTM. My name is Thomas Bonomo, and I am 12 years old. I lived in Greenwich my whole life. I would like you to consider children like me in this decision. Right now, I'm at the age where I'm allowed to walk the avenue by myself with my friends. Knowing the police are there to help us cross the street safely makes me feel a lot more comfortable roaming the avenue. I also see lots of drivers on their phones or some texting. But when they see the police, it reminds them to stop, to stop doing so, makes it, making it safer for me and other kids. Please take this issue seriously for kids who want to freely hang out in our downtown and feel safe from danger. Thank you. Thank you. Ren Harmon to be followed by Arlene Lamazo. Unmute, please. Hi, Ren Herman, thank you. I'm speaking to advocate the reinstatement of police to the avenue. Most points have been previously shared, but to quickly reiterate, the police presence is what sets our town apart from other communities. With new and proposed development in downtown Greenwich, as well as the upsurge of new residents, warmer weather, and the releasing of COVID restrictions, the downtown area will be busier than ever. The police presence not only helps to deter criminal activity, it keeps both pedestrians, including my young children and drivers safe. People dining outdoors with young children, possibly running into the street, pedestrians texting, cyclists, and visiting drivers. The police presence helps to keep a moving traffic flow down the avenue with all of this circus going on behind them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Arlene Lamazo to be followed by Michael Spilo. <coughs> Sorry, to be followed by Hiram Emery. Mr. Spilo has passed. Arlene Lamazo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Arlene Lamazo speaking for myself. A rendering of East Elm Street Avenue project, which we should have received shows in detail the restructuring of the intersection. As you can see, the bump outs have two benefits to improve safety. Number one, bump outs on the four corners of Greenwich Avenue will improve pedestrian safety by shortening the distance in the crosswalks for pedestrians and others who are crossing. And that's important. The shortening of the distance means that the pedestrian has much more time to get across safely without being stuck in the middle. Um, the enlarged open space, that is a visual open space within the intersection, provides much better sight lines for both the motorists, the pedestrians, and the handicapped. The bump outs will include large areas for bushes and other plantings at each of the four corners, creating a green space aesthetic. The intersection will be painted red, having the appearance of bricks. It's a bold look, will cause the motorist to stop to carefully assess things before proceedings. Um, the project will cost $200,000 as a one-time expense and it will last 30 years. The existing Storm Stewart infrastructure will have to be done with or without this project because the, 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 infra the infrastructure is very aged and must be replaced. The 250,000 restaurant barrier has nothing to do with this project. That's a totally separate issue. Those money should not be included in the estimates you've heard. Thank you. I would vote, I would urge you to vote no to this summer. Thank you. 
Hiram Emery to be followed by Brian Rainey. Uh, hi, this is Hiram Emery. Uh, oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Hi, uh, Hiram Emery. I grew up in town in the 70s and 80s, uh, rode my skateboard on Greenwich Avenue. Glad to hear that they're coming back. Um, but really, what, what, what I'm hearing here today, tonight, is that it seems to me that the politicians and the police really don't want to be on, on those little white circles, as they call them, which they're sort of demeaning uh, to, to them. And, and, and really, like, uh, growing up and, and when I brought my family back to town, it's so much of the charm of Greenwich and it's so much of the community. Uh, I, I strongly encourage you guys to vote. I, I, you know, if you ask me, would I rather stand in direct traffic or ride a bike up and down the avenue? I'd ride a bike. But it's about doing what's right for the community. And it's about really what, what I think about the cops, uh, you know, on the corners. They're the, they're the folks that are approachable. They're the people, hey, where's the, uh, where's the train station? Or, oh, I'm meeting someone here. Um, they represent Greenwich and I mean, you drive around town, you see how many of us are supporting uh, the cops of Greenwich. We want them to support us. And what they really do when they stand there in direct traffic is set the pace of town. They set the pace of the community and they're approachable and they're there. They're not on bikes zooming up and around, but they're there. We know they're there. They make us feel safe and they remind us of what a charming town we live in. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Rainey to be followed by Paul Olmsted. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'm not originally from town. Uh, I moved here 20 some years ago. I gotta say, when I first saw the police directing traffic on the avenue, I thought it was amazing. Uh, where I grew up, you, you tended to avoid the police. Here they're embedded in the community. They're part of it. Um, it's pretty pretty special um, tradition that we have here. Uh, is it a poor use of skilled officers? Probably, but it's great PR for the town and really sets us apart and makes us unique. Uh, as to whether we are, quote, telling, telling the police how to deploy, I think this is about um, telling our police commissioner, Mr. Camillo, the scope and nature of police department services we'd like. You know, you can't negotiate if you're not part of the conversation. And so far the conversations between, uh, been between Chief Heavey and Mr. Camillo who are both against this. So the SOMERS is, is a very crude tool to insert public sentiment into their discussions. Uh, I believe compromise is possible on this, if not on personnel, certainly on the hours and seasons uh, that we have officers directing traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Olmsted to be followed by Laura Darren. I, uh, I want to echo the thoughts that this is a waste of our time. I support the chief, and I think this is a decision that he should make, and it should not be the RTM micromanaging the police department. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Dar Darren to be followed by Nisha Kumar Berenger, perhaps. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Laura Darren. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. I am for returning the police to the traditional role on Greenwich Avenue. With the influx of out-of-towners I've witnessed in the last few weeks, Families crossing in the middle of the street, not paying attention to the crosswalks. Two cars starting to drive up the avenue the wrong way and all sorts of snarls due to parking spaces. An officer on the corner creates a sense of well-being. They add charm and a sense of decorum to our town. Let's not strip our town of all the traditions that are singular to Greenwich. If the town could get permission to have a retired policeman or a crossing guard directing the traffic, Sounds like that would be a great compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Nisha Kumar Berenger to be followed by Natalie Avey. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. This is Nisha Kumar Berenger. I've been a resident uh, with my family of Greenwich for the past 17 years. And I am here to support the reinstatement of the police onto Greenwich Avenue. I don't think it's, uh, I think it's incompatible to have no traffic lights and no police. It is very chaotic. I both drive quite a bit on Greenwich Avenue. I walk quite a bit. My children, my three children, uh, ages uh, 16, 13, and 11, uh, walk quite a bit on the avenue. And I find it 
as I said, very chaotic not to have it. I completely understand that we do not want to micromanage the <coughs> chief and I have tremendous respect for all of the work that these uh, fine men and women are doing to keep us safe and uh, actively uh, prevent and deter and um, counter crime in our community. Having said that, I don't think that it is, uh, I agree with my um, the previous speaker that it is not incompatible to have retired police, but much as we do uh, at the private school intersections um, throughout town that are quite effective and monitor traffic every day and there are, there are no issues there. So again, I'd like to support my, um, very actively support the reinstatement. And I also would like to support the comments of Alyssa um, Kalishan. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie Aidy to be uh, followed by Meg Critchell. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I, I was uh, to speak to the amendment. Do, do you want- All right. Well, all right, we'll just continue with the speakers and then I'll recognize you. Meg Critchell to be followed by um, Dan Quigley. Good evening, are you able to hear me? Yes. Um, Good evening, my name is Meg Critchell and I've been a Greenwich resident for over 10 years with three children under the age of 15 who attend school in the Greenwich public school system. Thank you all for taking the time to be here this evening and giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm speaking in favor of keeping the police presence on the avenue in our town. One of the things that lured our family to Greenwich many years ago was feeling safe and secure when we were out and about in the town of Greenwich, especially having come from this from New York City. The police in our intersections has set Greenwich apart from other towns. It's the first thing you see when you come into town from 95 and it sets a precedence, precedence that while Greenwich may be a large town, it is a small community where we all look out for each other crossing our streets. It sets us apart from the other towns, like I said. To be able to walk freely through the downtown part of Greenwich, knowing there are police on the corners to help as I navigate, and ensure safety as we cross the streets made us feel good about the town. Now that my children are the age to go downtown on their own, I breathe e easier knowing they'll be safe, safer, and that I can allow them to have the freedoms that they would not have in other places, nor the freedoms that we had growing up. I've been reading about the ever-increasing crime in the downtown, and it seems to be getting worse, especially with all happening with COVID. I often walk downtown and I've been frustrated and disappointed by the cars that have been coming into the corners and cruising down the avenue at crazy speeds. People don't know who should go first, who should cross the street, are we letting handicapped, elderly, or children go, let alone the cars I've seen driving the wrong way up the avenue. It seems taking the policemen off these corners has caused quite a bit of confusion. Traffic has picked up, and there are more and more out of towners. There's more traffic congestion. Thank, thank you very much. That's the two minute mark. Our next speaker is Dan Quigley to be followed by Duncan Burke. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, fellow RTM members. Uh, I speak tonight as a resident of downtown Greenwich, uh, West Elm Street to be precise. Um, and I think I may be the only RTM member who actually lives on West Elm Street. I've lived downtown for more than 15 years and grew up in Greenwich, so I'm very well aware of the passion people have in town for the tradition of having our police on the avenue directing traffic. This is an issue that, issue that elicits a lot of emotions, especially among the people who live in District 1, and I understand the feelings of those in my district. However, I really don't recognize the Greenwich Avenue about which people are speaking tonight. This sounds like the most dangerous place on earth. Uh, crossing Greenwich Avenue sounds more like crossing a racetrack during the Indy 500 than it does our Main Street, and it simply isn't the case. As someone who's constantly walking downtown, usually accompanied by my very active seven-year-old son, I can say with great confidence that since the police were removed from the avenue on West Elm and Arch Street at the outset of COVID, I haven't really noticed any upticks in speeding or marked danger signs on or around Greenwich Avenue. In my estimate, bump outs will provide more safety than traffic officers at intersections. And this may sound a little contrarian, but in fact, it makes sense because officers were in place for traffic duty from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. six days a week. When they were gone, there was nothing there to prevent speeding. The bump outs and raised bumps on the avenue will be there for 24-7, seven days a week. 
On the issue of removing the police from the avenue, in fact, that's not what's occurring. Police women and men will be used to greater effect in the avenue by walking the beat and riding on patrol bikes. Considering the current climate in our country, I think that getting our officers out and about will naturally lead to improved community engagement. And this will go a long way to making an already good relationship between the GPD and our community better. Chief Heavey has endorsed this. Alan Gunsberg of the chair of the First Selectman's Committee with People with Disabilities has endorsed this and the first selectman has endorsed it. Recognizing the passions involved with respect to those who brought the SOMER, I would urge my fellow RTM colleagues to vote against it tonight. Thank you very much. Duncan Burke to be followed by Bill Lewis. Yeah, try, try the Nancy Burke. Is Duncan Burke with us? Can you hear me? No, I can't. Yes. Here. You can hear me. Here. Thank yes, you. we can. Okay. Uh, I was expecting to sec second the um, amendment. So you All right. This is not, we're, we're not on the amendment. Did you want to speak on the amendment? I, I would be seconding the amendment when it happens. Yes. Do you want to speak on item one in general? I would also speak on item one if you'd like. Um, I've been I don't know if you like. I would like, yes. Go ahead. All right. Um, I've been here since uh, 1983, and uh, I'm, um, I had four children who were around my life at the time I came here in 1983. My son went to Eagle Hill School, and I had, uh, I had three teenage daughters older than he and uh, uh, they were all over town. Uh, they were driving in town and so forth. So for years, I've uh, appreciated the policemen on Greenwich Avenue. So um, uh, safety basis, mainly uh, quality of life also. And uh, I, I want to say also that I uh, have such a very high regard for Chief Heavey and the wonderful police department in Greenwich. And I'm a graduate also of the Citizens Police Academy. Uh, most impressive thing I've ever done in this town, uh, singular, wonderful thing. And um, I'm very much support the, um, the, the police to remain on Greenwich Avenue. Uh, and uh, I'll come back when, uh, when it's time to, to uh, speak on the amendment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bill Lewis to be followed by Chief Heavey, who will be our final speaker before we take up the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I live uh, on East Elm Street, sort of opposite uh, Mr. Quigley, and I'm on the RTM in District 1. And I think the question is really simple. Do we want to continue the 94-year-old tradition of officers overseeing safety at Elm Street and Havemeyer, or do we instead want them roving on bicycles? This isn't about bump outs. And it isn't about the budget, because either way, the headcount, which drives the cost, is remaining the same. This also isn't about stopping shoplifting and street crime. The ORCA program started in 2018, and we're told it was an immediate big success while the officers were still manning the intersections. So in other words, there's no obviously no need to redeploy traffic officers to bolster an already uh, proven successful uh, ORCA program. In fact, I think it's really hard to understand the rationale for this radical change that Mr. Camillo is, is promoting, despite all the talk. There have been vague references to, quote, modernizing traffic control, supported by implausible claims like one of, by a police captain in the Greenwich Free Press on January 20th. He said, quote, they, the officers on the bicycles, are doing everything the officer in the circle is doing, but they're mobile. I mean, I, is that even remotely believable? How can an officer riding around on a bicycle continuously monitor a particular intersection to help seniors, the disabled, and the able-bodied alike of all ages cross safely? Um, I Bottom line, like, like so many have said so well before here tonight, uh, I urge a yes vote both for safety and tradition, all at no added cost to us. Thank you. Our Greenwich Police Chief, Jim Heavey. 
Good evening, Mr. Moderator, RTM members, and uh, fellow residents. Um, I'm going to cut some of my uh, comments so that we are in the interest of time. I want to recognize uh, that all of, all of the com all the commenters, uh, what they've said is important to us, and it's unfortunate that uh, kind of feel like an adversary uh, at this point over the last two months uh, trying to address this issue. I think uh, an important part is that communication could have been better about how we have in the last few years redeployed uh, police on the avenue. And um, I'll certainly work on trying to improve that. I wish that someone, uh, some of the people who had uh, proposed the SOMA had come to me and asked me what was going on or asked an officer. The other matter of communication I think is important as I've heard several comments made about what's going on on the avenue and how uh, dangerous it might be. Um, please stop the bike officers or call the police stop me when you see me on the avenue on a daily basis and and we can address those issues as they arise. Um, we have a thing called uh, CAP, Community and Police Partnership, which uh, some RTM members are actually a member of, uh, but it's all the representatives of the different associations in town so they can keep a prize of what we're doing. And we're going to continue to try to uh, improve the communication through that. And of course, you hear about the Citizens Police Academy. I think I've probably done some good work on recruiting members to the RTM because we talk about town government when um, people go through the program. So um, cops are not gone from the avenue uh, and everyone has heard about all our ORCA team, our bike team, our foot team, the, the officers in cars. And yes, it's for over 90 years, uh, officers have been direct, directing traffic, but now we redeployed those officers. I certainly care about safety. My, my parents, uh, you know, I grew up in town. I grew up on Lewis Street. I worked at Greenwich Drugstore. I'm fully aware of it. My parents still live only blocks away from the avenue as well as my mother-in-law. Um, so it's not like I'm just putting, uh, leaving uh, the safety concerns to, um, to someone else or that we don't, we don't care about that. It is more effective and more efficient. The manner in which we are currently uh, deploying the officers and increased hours and increased days as Captain uh, Zuccarello has mentioned. Um, the senior center has been closed and, and actually we haven't had the, the officers have been redeployed for almost a year because of the pandemic. And um, the senior center has been closed except for food pickup. The bike officers or the other officers assigned to the Greenwich Avenue have been helping with those problems. Um, the Selectman's Advisory on People with Disabilities has endorsed the changes to the intersections. And again, some of this has been muddied by whether those, those things should happen or not happen. Um, Stop signs work all over town and the stop signs are there. I know that there's a concern about putting traffic lights there. Traffic lights could be computerized if that was something that was considered, but I'm not advocating either way, but something to look at. And there's a traffic study being done by the Public Works Department now to look at how those things are happening. And we recognize it, it, the traffic today is different than it'll be in the summer, but also it's different prior to the pandemic and post pandemic. And we keep looking at that. Um, Looking at statistics, I think it's important for people to realize that we have some flexibility and that we're always looking at what's going on. I recognize Habermeyer Place at Greenwich Avenue will not be abandoned and that the officers on bike have um, on numerous occasions assumed a traffic position there to, in order to, to assist with traffic. And again, when the, when the traffic conditions change, they're responsive. They'll park the bike and they'll get out there on the intersection. The other thing is, is that it, it seems like Unfortunately, that sometimes it's well, we've done this all, we've always done it this way, and that if we change it, it somehow wouldn't be able to be um, modified closer to what it once was. So um, my, my promise to everyone in town is that we'll continue to address the concerns, just like we look at response times and car posts uh, for the regular patrol staff to make sure that we level out the, the response times to make it quickest as we can to emergencies and that the officers are um, freed up to do traffic enforcement all over town. We recognize that the more traffic enforcement that's done, the less accidents there are. Um, DWIs have increased considerably post pandemic. Those are things that we're, we're trying to address. Um, it has been mentioned, Lewis Street has not had an officer in 12 years. We do have holiday traffic and sidewalk sales when we modify the, the assignments and do put the officers out there. Um, I think it's more important to be safe than to feel safe. And I know sometimes it looks, it, it has an appearance, but uh, that's not always the same. The POCD is again, looking at all of those types of things. And someone has said about putting retired officers, we really can't supplant the union uh, Silver Shield collective bargaining agreement officers, but we would have to address that. 
and there are state statutes, which people have been looking up to make sure I'm not making that up. Um, but there is a concern um, about who can do a traffic direction and the, cre the created liability for that if we were put civilians. The police department hires 25 school crossing guards and we have a challenge when they don't show up, a police officer has to fill in. So um, again, I, I ran through all of my things rather quickly and skipped some that have already been mentioned. Um, I've been told numerous times to not take it personal, but I do because I, I'm a resident, I grew up here and uh, this is a great town and it isn't a great town because a, a policeman stands in a little white circle. It isn't that the officers are, are rather ride bikes than direct traffic. It's they wanna be police officers and it is more work because they've been doing a lot more work on the bikes and on foot than they would if they were just uh, swinging their arms and doing traffic. So again, I mentioned it before that a vote for this SOMA is a vote of no confidence in your police leadership. So I'd really like you to say, vote no on, on this uh, SOMA and we will assure you that we'll continue to have a dialogue about how we deploy all our officers. And just lastly, two years ago, I, we had 155 of our police officers working for the town of Greenwich. Last year, it's 100, it was 154, and this year, it's 152. So we have three less officers working for the town of Greenwich as sworn police officers than we did uh, just three years ago. And that's a reduction from 176 that we had um, years ago when I came on the police force. So we are having to do more services uh, with less officers. And if we returned officers to the avenue at the corners directing traffic, we would have to modify some services in another way. And I'm hoping that people will give this system a chance and continue to communicate. We'll try to communicate more effectively and that people will report these incidents and concerns they have so that we can effectively uh, and efficiently respond to all the concerns on the avenue. So again, I, I thank you for the time and uh, appreciate all the comments and hope that we'll, uh, we'll be able to move forward with some good dialogues. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes our list of speakers on the uh, sense of meeting resolution in general. Natalie Aidy has a motion to amend. Natalie Aidy. Hi, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I Do you need me to read the motion or do you just put it on the screen? Uh, yes, well, all right, so we, we have a slide. You can, you can describe it and then we'll have it moved and seconded. So feel free to summarize what it is or read it at your pleasure. Sure. Okay. We we have. Um, okay. So the changes that you made are in red. Okay. So we we added the sentence to uh, try to reflect what's happened because of the pandemic, and uh, it doesn't show the scratch out. But um, as their presence has been. Well, then you're going you're, you're to have to describe what it is, because this is what we yeah, understand. Um, the slide is not quite correct. After the first edition in red, the part that begins with, as their presence has been essential, um, that should be struck through. All, all the way through decades? All the way through. Yep, all the way through decades. Okay. Um, what so else? Added, added the, the sentence in red and then added the paragraph below. Uh, be it further resolved that the police department consider ways to transition non-police officers to the role of traffic as allowed by law and contracts. All right. Is there a second to that motion to amend? There is a second. All right. So that is now before us. Um, Ms. Adi, did you bring this before any committees? No, it did not come before any committees. All right, so we don't have a, a speaker list for this. We're somewhat adrift here. Um, we'll we'll have to, excuse it. me. I have a few comments I could say to it as well. If that... All right, go ahead. Okay, um, so I propose this amendment because I, I feel a compromise could be had. Um, removing the policeman from Greenwich Avenue has definitely been a big change to our town, one that I personally struggled with. On one hand, I understand that using these highly trained officers to direct traffic is not the best use of their years of training. And on the other hand, their presence brings another level of safety and security to the avenue. If we were able to return policemen to directing traffic, we as a town need to be flexible. They are not needed at every intersection all of the time. 
more realistic is some of the intersections some of the time. Perhaps we could use non-officers to direct traffic, or possibly we don't need to direct traffic, but we need to focus on helping pedestrians. Perhaps we could use a crossing guard or crossing guards to help the pedestrians stay safe. Being flexible could achieve safety for people and cars on the avenue while also making better use of our officers and the years of training and resources that we have invested in them. I understand that there are currently contractual obligations that present obstacles, but contracts change over time. And since it's our town, we should weigh in on potential changes. Thank you. That, that's all my comments. All right. So the reason we asked for advance notice of any proposed motions is so that we're not in this position. Um, I'm going to have to open this up for discussion. If anyone who wants to address this motion to amend, please raise your hand. Well, okay. I'm, I, I, I would, I would allow Chief Hebe to speak last. Are there any others? Ron Carousella. Okay. You have the floor. Unmute, please. Mr. Carousella. Who's our next speaker? Richard Newman, Chair of our Town Services Committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, since this was not before Town Services, I guess I will speak on my own. Um, you know, I heard the comments that were just read and I'm reading the resolution and the comments of moving officers around and letting them direct traffic and do other things, which is what we've been talking about in town services, giving Chief Evie the right to use his officers as he deems fit. I just don't think it matches the amendment that's before us. Uh, we talked about in our uh, uh, original meeting, which, is, and I mentioned it to Ed Dodakis, if you think it's just to start a, a discussion, why is it so precise? resolved that it is the sense of the meeting that the Greenwich police should be returned to their traditional role directed traffic on Greenwich Avenue. That's the point that I hear. That's the point that Chief Heavey hears. I don't think this amendment really changes that. Thank you. Thank you. Further speakers? Who do we have? Dan Ozesmeyer. Yes, uh, thank you. I hadn't intended to speak on item one, but although I accept that the amendment is a, a sincere attempt to find a middle ground, I think in my view, we spent an hour and a half of discussion on this item. I think that the idea of the police optimizing their delivery is something the chief has already said he would consider. Um, while this might be something that we can consider or discuss in the future, my view is that um, it's the best for the RTM to um, reject this amendment and take up the question as originally asked, where we had 40 speakers and an hour and a half of discussion and put to this, this to bed either way. Thank you. Further? Well, the phone number ending in 3231. Phone number ending in 3231. You have to hit star six to unmute. Do we have that person on the phone? Star six to unmute. Is that what you're saying? Yourself, All right, if you don't unmute, then we're moving on. Last last call. Star six. Star hey, six. Uh, this is Duncan Burke. Go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, I was uh, planning to second the amendment, and uh, I, I don't know where where that stands uh, with you, Tom. I Obviously, I strongly support the SOMER, and I strongly support the amendment to give us uh, some flexibility that we might be able to uh, consider, um, you know, non-police or retired police 
crossing guards. And I think that would be a good thing. Um, I don't know if we want to take all night trying to get to an amendment, but I, I would second the amendment if uh, that's appropriate. And I think that would You're be on the amendment. A, amendment a, has a been good moved. deal of flexibility <laughs> dialed in. Sorry? The amendment was moved and seconded. You're now speaking on it. Okay. Well, I think that the, all right, I'll take it from there. I think that that would um, give us, uh, you know, some considerable flexibility in looking at it going forward to consider some of these um, additional ideas. So I think it's, I think it's worthwhile, whether we want to spend the time on it tonight, you know, is a matter of, um, for you to decide. So anyway, I think it's a very good idea. Thanks very much. Any others? Can we call the question on the amendment, sir? Yeah, who made that motion? Well, all right, uh, Chief Peavy, and then I'll come back. Who who just made that motion? That was Dan. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna recognize Chief Peavy if he wants to address this amendment, and then I'm gonna recognize Mr. Ozismir, and he, I understand he'll make a motion for the previous question, which requires a two thirds vote in favor. Uh, Chief Peavy. Uh, Mr. Moderator, RTM members, uh, very quickly, again, this is a recognition and just a uh, example of how we need to improve communication. Uh, I certainly see this amendment as as uh, reinforcement of things I've already said that we're, we're not uh, that our deployment is not etched in stone and that we can change things. So, again, I feel like a vote of no, uh, a no vote on the SOMER will give the police department um, the uh, the vote of confidence to make those decisions and we'll continue to improve the communication. Uh, again, my office number is 622-8010. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to hear uh, when, when people can communicate these concerns for us so that uh, I can continue to you know, have a, the department address the concerns and improve the service to the department, uh, to the town. Again, I apologize for uh, going on, but thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Osmer. I'd like to call a question. Please. Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded that we immediately, the motion for the previous question is a motion to cut off the date. If it uh, passed, if it is um, approved by a two thirds vote, we would hear no further discussion on the motion to amend. Remember, this is the motion to amend, not the merits of the sense of the meeting resolution. Um, in the first instance, I will call for a raised hand vote. Now, if we, if we, so the, if you are in favor of immediately proceeding to vote on the AD motion to amend item one, you should raise your hand um, supporting the motion for the previous question. If you want to hear more discussion on the motion to amend, when I call for the no votes, then you should raise your hand then. All right, so all hands down, only members are voting. All those in favor of immediately cutting off debate and proceeding to vote on the motion to amend, please raise your hand. All right, looks like about 156 or 57. All hands down, please. All those who would like to hear more discussion on the motion to amend, please raise your hand. All right, motion for the previous question has carried by a two thirds, more than a two thirds vote. All right, will the district tabulators please mark your voting cards. 80, motion to amend item one. If you are in favor of the amendment, you vote yes. If you are against the amendment, you vote no. Please understand, this is not a vote on the merits of the sense of the meeting resolution. It's just, are we going to change it before we take up that final vote? So if you want to amend it before we Vote finally, vote yes. If you want to leave it as it was on the call so that that's what we vote on, you vote no to this motion to amend. All right, we'll have to await the result of this. So we have a five, five minute uh, clock going, thank you.
Okay, so we do not have to await the result of this vote. Um, it is still in process. We will continue with the next item on our agenda. That is item number two. Now, this is also a second read. I explained to the district and committee chairs at our moderators committee last month um, that my judgment on the second read is if something comes before us and the second read rule encourages us to rework it and put it in shape if we think it is not in shape the first time, when that comes back reworked, that is the second read, even though it's not identical to what was before us the first time. So that is, that is my judgment as to what we have here. We referred the proposal that came to us to a special committee and the understanding from the discussions was that it would be drafted as a separate ordinance, but it addresses the same issue of blighted properties. And so this is our second read. We can take a final vote tonight. We can do anything else. So my ruling that this second read is not advocating that we dispose of it tonight. It just gives a majority the right to decide. So. Um, the difference between item one, which didn't need to be presented, and item two is that item two is not in exactly the same form. So I will now rep uh, recognize Adam Brodsky, who was chair of the special committee that worked on this to present it. Adam Brodsky. Um, would you like me to read the uh, whereas clause or would you like me to read my remarks? Well, you can, you can just summarize it and say it's the same as appears on the call. Um, absolutely. So. Um, um, the, the whereas clause as referenced in the call is what everybody's reviewed and that's what we're uh, voting on this evening. All right, but for, th for those who are not members and may not have seen this, just a brief description of, of what we are now taking up. Okay, so whereas the Blight Ordinance Subcommittee of the RTM has found that dilapidated or blighted structures, buildings or premises located within the town of Greenwich contribute to the decline of neighborhoods that the existence of such structures, buildings, or premises adversely affects the economic well being of the town and is harmful to the health, safety, and welfare of the residents of the town. Resolve that the RTM adopt the blighted buildings or properties ordinance as follows. All right. And uh, because this comes from one of our special committees, it does not require a second, and it is now before us. So we will first take up the uh, reports, the reports of the committees that considered this, beginning with Kip Bergweger, chair of our legislative and rules committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, members of the RTM and, and uh, Greenwich residents. The legislative and rules committee first met in a joint meeting with the land use committee last Monday. All legislative and rules districts were present. We were assisted by members of the Blight Ordinance Special Committee, Lucy Von Brockel, Scott Kalb, and Adam Brodsky during the joint meeting, and Scott Kalb and Adam Brodsky during the separate meeting. These are the points that were made during the joint meeting. The Blight Ordinance first came to the RTM last year as a part of the town's nuisance ordinance, and a special committee was formed to deal with it. The special committee has separated the concepts of blight and nuisance. Blight difference from, differs from nuisance and needs to be addressed in a separate ordinance. Blight typically involves structures, whereas nuisance can include odors, discarded automobiles, garbage, and weeds. Statutes addressing these areas are different, necessitating a separate ordinance for blight. The special committee met 16 times and interviewed several town officers who play roles in this area. The special committee reviewed over 70 or 80 ordinances in the state asked for and received input from many persons, including district chairs and the Board of Selectmen, and worked closely with the Law Department. Under the ordinance, a blight officer is appointed. The blight officer will be subject to a blight review board. There's been some question about the makeup of a blight review board, but it should be noted that Ben Branion, the town administrator, currently has a task force that has been performing the same kind of work as the Blight Review Board would do. In drafting the Blight Ordinance, the Special Committee worked to balance the rights of property owners with the needs of the town. The Blight Review Board will intervene as necessary to develop an action plan to remediate a blight problem. There are 
many instances where due process will be extended to affected persons. Consideration has been taken for extenuating circumstances, including economics and the disability of the property owners involved. The Blight Review Board, working with a resident property owner and Blight Officer, will be proactive. The ordinance has a good cause standard. Good cause can be special considerations such as age, health, and mental health. A member expressed concern that a person could lose their property because of a lack of standards. Members of the special committee remarked that the approach under the ordinance is to have a collaborative process that gathers all relevant information and is participatory. The process is objective. It creates a paper trail and a way to deal with blight. The blight ordinance will address all kinds of situations ranging from people who are having difficulty to those who choose to ignore their properties to the detriment of their neighbors. At our separate meeting, legislative and rules continued the discussion about the power of the blight officer and who should appoint the blight officer. One member was concerned about a, the blight officer's judgment. Another member wanted to minimize politics in the selection of the blight officer by requiring bipartisan agreement on the officer. <clears throat> An amendment was proposed to the ordinance that the blight officer would be appointed on, quote, unanimous vote of the board of selectmen. This amendment passed by a vote of seven to five with districts seven, eight, nine, 11, and 12 voting no. A member expressed concern that the blight review board would be composed of senior town employees in contrast to other boards and commissions that are composed of residents nominated and approved by the Board of Selectmen and the RTM. The senior town officials would not necessarily have expertise in evaluating, evaluating blight. And then a member made a motion to postpone the blight ordinance. The movement, movement felt that the ordinance was a complex item involves serious decisions and needs further consideration. Time was to reflect is needed on such a significant item. A vote on postponing was four in favor and eight against, with districts one, two, five, and nine voting in favor. We then voted on the uh, legal order and the merits of this matter as amended. The vote in each case was 12 0, zero. I will offer the amendment at the appropriate time. Thank you. Peter Berg, chair of our land use committee. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Before, before Mr. Berg uh, takes the floor, I do have the result of the vote on the sense of the meeting resolution regarding police on Greenwich Avenue. This was item number one. Those in favor, 81. Opposed, 127. Abstaining, seven. That item has failed. Peter Berg, Chair of our Land Use Committee. Good evening, Mr. Moderator and fellow members. Um, so as Mr. Bergwager just explained, we, we met in joint session with uh, legislative and rules. Uh, so I won't repeat much of this. Uh, we did have a member ex express concern that the special uh, special considerations were not explicit enough and could result in a lack of protection for property owners. Subcommittee members responded that this ordinance includes a number of opportunities for a property owner to seek relief. Mr. Brodsky explained that the ordinance needed to strike a balance between the needs of the town, the property owner, and the neighbors seeking relief from blight. Ms. Weisbecker provided an explanation of how the courts and the legal system address the term good cause. Uh, in response to a question about the potential costs and liens on a property, Ms. Von Brockel provided some statistics from another Connecticut municipality, which had 157 complaints and only four properties fined over a five year period and the subcommittee explained that most properties are quickly remediated by a property owner upon receipt of a notice that they may be in violation. And towns typically work with those in violation to remedy problems before issuing a citation. 
the land use committee voted 10 one one in favor of adopting the ordinance as it appears on the call. District one abstained, district three voted no because uh, they felt the special considerations in the ordinance did not adequately protect property owners with extenuating circumstances. So again, our vote was 10 in favor, one opposed, one abstention. Thank you. Alexis Volgaris, Chair of our Health and Human Services Committee. Good evening. The Health and Human Services Committee took this up last Tuesday. Joining us were Owen Weaver, Outside Counsel, Adam Brodsky, Chairman of the Blight Subcommittee, and three additional subcommittee members, Sam Tam, Lucy Von Brockel, and Scott Kalb. I believe the two previous speakers covered many of the details surrounding the land use and legal implications from this proposal. So I will briefly mention the public health and mental health issues that the committee discussed with our guests. The Health and Human Services Committee believes that for those individuals who live in a blighted property, that there are often underlying issues such as a mental health problem that prevents the homeowner from addressing their housing problem. Issues related to poverty, advanced age, and physical disability may also hamper a homeowner's ability to address blight. In addition to potential social service issues associated with blight, there are also public health issues such as rodent or pest infestation. Health and Human Services was pleased to hear that the proposed Blight Review Board is expected to include the Commissioner of Human Services and the Director of Health. We believe that by including those leaders who offer expertise in the area of mental health and public health, they can provide an additional layer of support for a homeowner who may have underlying issues that are contributing to their circumstances. One of our members did express some concern that if an elderly or infirm resident was found to be living in a blighted property, with the threat of ultimately losing his or her home through eviction, that the stress of such an outcome could further negatively impact an already fragile situation. Both Mr. Brodsky and Mr. Kalb reiterated that the subcommittee strive to form a compassionate blight review board and that the proposed ordinance includes special protections for those who are disabled, low income or senior citizens. Members of the Health and Human Services Committee noted that the Department of Human Services currently has a task force that deals with residents who are living in a hoarding situation. And while not identical to a blight situation, there are caseworkers on staff who are trained to deal with complex mental health issues when clients who are living in suboptimal housing conditions are found. Our vote on item two was 11-1-0 with district three voting no. And the committee would like to thank uh, the Blight Subcommittee for their work on developing this ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Spilo with Public Works Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Public Works met on Monday, March 1st. We had DPW Commissioner Seabird, Building Official Marr, uh, Greenwich Fire Department, Fire Marshal Practico, Blight Subcommittee members Brodsky, Kalb, and Singer, uh, Blake, Blight Advisor Attorney Herbst and Weaver. Uh, we had a presentation about the need for the ord ordinance followed by an extensive discussion regarding concerns raised by several members of the committee. Members of the Blight Committee indicated that they had multiple meetings and re reviewed ordinances in other towns. The um, member, uh, one member of the Blight Committee felt that this represented um, their opinion of what are the best practices. However, in addressing the issues raised by the committee, the representatives of the Blight Committee acknowledged that they hadn't considered some of the issues that were raised and were amenable to making changes. One member of the Blight Committee suggested we draft a series of amendments to address these issues. In the end, since the Blight Subcommittee seemed amenable to several of the proposed changes, Public Works opted not to word Smith from the floor, but rather to refer the item back to the subcommittee to try and address as many of these as possible ahead. Uh, if concerns remained, the few remaining issues could be addressed with amendments for consideration by the full RTM. It was noted that many of the blighted properties were a result of owners who were facing difficulties and may be unable to respond entirely. And the Blight Committee agreed and felt that they had addressed these issues. However, Pub Public Works felt that there were several, that several such issues remained. Um, there were 15 individual issues raised by Public Works Committee, and these were emailed around to all committee chairs. Rather than go through each, I'll summarize these concerns in broad strokes. 
There were issues concerning the minimum timeline, which was too short with insufficient constraints. As an example, a homeowner would typically, typically have less than 30 days and as little as two weeks to respond to the initial complaint. And there was also no minimum timeline defined for the remediation process. Concerns about the process was the second major category, allowing the owner to, to be represented by an attorney at an appeal um, is missing in Section 8C. The need for multiple blight officers and the independence of the appeals process, uh, this being unlike other types of appeals of consequence in town. Also concerns were raised about the fines being pegged at the maximum, insufficient requirements for um, the uh, poor and disadvantaged homeowners, uh, concerns about the broad definition of blight and the lack of a requirement for documentation of specifics, and concerns about the needs for new emergency powers. The Public Works uh, voted 10-1-0 to refer the item back to the committee in an attempt to resolve these issues rather than take up a series of amendments at the RTM. Uh, District uh, 10 was the one that voted against the motion to refer. Um, thank you. Thank you. Richard Newman, chair of our town services committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The town services took this up for the second read Tuesday, March 2nd. Um, we had in, with us Adam Brodsky, chairman of the committee, Lucy, Lucy Von Brockel, secretary, uh, our own Diana Singer, uh, town services delegate from district 10 who was on the committee and Chief Heavey uh, stayed with us from the previous discussion. Uh, I wanna point out the first comment of the night was this was the best written ordinance ever put before the RTM. And I want to congratulate the RTM subcommittee for its hard work. That was a comment from one of our members. We discussed the questions brought by public works. We discussed the rights of the neighbors of the blighted properties. We knew that the town attorney, police chief, fire chief, human services, uh, all reviewed and had given feedback that helped construct the ordinance. Uh, the Blight Review Board brings the relevant experts together to solve the blight issues. The committee, we were told, studied 10 other municipal blight ordinances for guidance. 70 of 75 largest towns have blight ordinances. Blight is not only a visual, uh, but has health issues of rodents, insects, garbage inside the homes. We discussed postponing for another read. Um, Adam um, Brodsky said that he welcomes input from the RTM, but the committee believes the ordinance is complete. If we would like to amend on the floor, we can have those votes. Um, we, a motion was brought to postpone. Uh, that vote was two in favor, 10 against, with um, districts two and 10 voting four, or no, districts one and nine voting four, majority voting no, that failed. The item as presented, we passed 12 0 0. All right, thank you. So I understand from those reports that we have two motions to be offered by our committees a motion to amend by legislative and rules, and a motion to refer by Public Works. I will recognize uh, Michael Spilo, chair of the Public Works Committee, to offer that their motion. Uh, Sorry about that, a uh, little technical difficulty. Um, Public Works moved to refer the item to back to the subcommittee to consider the, uh, uh, com the, we had the wording, don't have it in front of me. Uh, to consider the issues raised by the Public Works Committee. All right, that being a motion offered on behalf of one of our committees does not require a second and is currently before us. We did have a speaker sign up list for this motion to refer. And we'll follow the same procedure. Uh, I remind all speakers that we have a two minute limit in effect here. Um, Mr. Spilo, did you, did you wanna go first or last? Okay, Lucy Von 
Brockle to be followed by Svetlana Wasserman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, when items are referred back to a subcommittee, the subcommittee is generally provided some direction or instructions by the body. If this motion does receive the support of this body, it is important that the body is clear on what direction the subcommittee has received. Four or five committees voted overwhelmingly to adopt the ordinance as it appears on the call or with a single amendment. Individual members circulated numerous concerns and questions, which the subcommittee has taken time to consider and respond to with our reasoned justifications. And Public Works voted 10-1-0 to refer this item back to the subcommittee, but did not vote on any specific directions to the subcommittee. So we have a majority ready to move this ordinance forward and a minority with concerns. If this is referred back to the subcommittee, this body would be asking us to consider those minority concerns. But after responding to the Public Works list and comments of individuals, what remains are simply disagreements between individuals in the subcommittee. Disagreements may not be resolved by having the subcommittee consider them again. When there's an impasse, it might be more productive for amendments to be voted on by the full RTM. Please also consider the extent to which the subcommittee sought input before the ordinance was published in the call. We interviewed town officials, shared draft ordinances with town officials and RTM members, reviewed many other ordinances and worked closely with the town attorneys at each of our meetings. We incorporated everything we were able to and have welcomed proposed amendments. Remember that if unforeseen issues arise with the blight ordinance, we are empowered to amend the ordinance as we see fit. The subcommittee took its job very seriously, and if this item is referred back to us, we would of course take that decision seriously as well. But this is a well-researched, well-vetted, thoughtful and lenient ordinance, and frankly, it is impossible to please everyone or ensure that you have covered every possible scenario. I ask you to vote no on this motion to refer this item back to the subcommittee. Thank you. Svetlana Wasserman be followed by Cheryl Moss. Uh, hi, am I unmuted? We can hear you. Thank you. Um, moment. Thank you, moderator Burns and honored members of the RTM. I will be speaking against the motion to refer the blight ordinance back to the subcommittee. I'm a member of the Public Works Committee. At our meeting last week, the Public Works Committee voted to support this motion raised by its chairman to refer the blight ordinance back to the subcommittee. I voted against it. If Public Works had wanted to make changes to the ordinance, they had every opportunity to do so. For example, the draft ordinance was shared with the Chairman of Public Works in advance with the request for suggestions. Last week's Public Works meeting provided another opportunity to make amendments to the ordinance, but no vote was taken to do so. And no vote was taken on the merits of the blight ordinance either. The only vote that was proposed was to send the item back to committee with the same dozen or so concerns to which the subcommittee had already fully and thoughtfully responded. Four of the five committees to whom the blight ordinance was referred voted in favor of it, with an aggregate of 45 in favor and two opposed, as is, or with one minor amendment. We've heard from members of the community whose health and home values have suffered without this blight ordinance. We should focus on what the majority of our community and the majority of the RTM wants and vote on the merits of the blight ordinance tonight. Therefore, I urge you uh, not to vote in favor of this motion. Thank you. Cheryl Moss to be followed by Marita Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, members of the RTM and guests. I am voting, uh, excuse me, I'm speaking tonight um, against this motion to refer. Any legislation has to find balance between language that is so specific it creates loopholes with language that is too ambiguous to be interpreted by the courts. Perfection is not possible. Don't let the desire for perfection stop you from doing good. Please vote no against this motion. Thank you. Marita Hamry to be followed by Dr. Carl Carlson. Hi, I would just like to uh, stand in opposition to the amendment. I don't see any purpose in sending uh, this back to the committee that has already done everything that they intend to do with it. Um, and after they've already addressed the issues that have been raised. Thank you. Dr. Carl Carlson to be followed by Chris Carletti. The moderator, can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Moderator and members of the RTM, I really do think that the blight officer uh, should be handled by the RTM and interviewed by RTM committees. 
I think that the blight officer should uh, be uh, voted on by the Board of Selectmen and not just appointed by the first selectmen. I think a person who is accused of blight should know who's accusing him. I think there is ambiguous language. I point to the section of definitions in the first numbered section, subsection I, the last clause, otherwise put at risk the benefit of health and safety of the citizens, first respondents and municipal officials. I think you need clarity. The language is not clear. And when the language is not clear on law, there is an inherent problem and the problems develop over time. Thank you. Chris Carletti <clears throat> to be followed by Fred Salisbury. Yes, thank you. This is Chris. Um, I've read this proposed ordinance several times, and I'm very impressed with it in terms of it being very clear and very narrowly defined to address only major issues like collapsing roofs, exterior walls that are falling down, boarded up or missing windows, or other major structural defects. There is no wording in this ordinance at all to pursue cosmetic or frivolous issues against property owners. Special consideration is clearly illustrated for the elderly, disabled, and low-income residents who need it. And under this ordinance, an exceptionally broad consensus across departments is required like I've never seen before. This includes town administrator, police, fire, building official, human services, health, planning and zoning, and the fire marshal. And I honestly don't see any evidence whatsoever for any kind of slippery slope that has been alluded to. And frankly, I believe this motion is just obstructionism and should be rejected. Thank you. All right, well, we don't, <clears throat> we don't attack motives. Everyone is free to um, present their arguments. So I call that uh, speaker to order. Fred Salisbury to be followed by Dora Vardis. All right, Dora Vardis to be followed by Laura Monelli. All right, again, when the name is called, if you could help us out by raising your hand, we're not fine. Phone number with their hand raised, so Dora is 2690. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna recognize 2690. Please identify yourself. Hello, you need, Hello. Need, hi, this is Laura, can you hear me? All right, Laura Minnelli. Uh, yes, yes we, hi, can you hear me? Go ahead, yep. Thank you, thank you, appreciate your time. Um, I urge everyone to drive by 180 Hobart Avenue. I live right next door to a blighted house that has been abandoned for nearly 10 years. There's blue tarp that covers the entire back of the house. There's a door nailed to the roof, broken windows that have been boarded up that should just be a temporary fix, but have been like that for years. And I have two very small children. Uh, we have seen raccoons, we've seen rats, um, and all the owner does is just cut the grass maybe once a month and drive his car and go somewhere else in Greenwich where he lives. It doesn't seem fair, so I just want to express my concern and thank you for your time. Thank you. Bill Lewis, to be followed by Michelle Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I support the motion to refer this back to the blight subcommittee. We all want a blight ordinance, but we create even more problems if we rush it. Uh, Mr. Spilo and his committee and Mr. Leonard and his excellent letter that he sent around have pointed out the many shortcomings in the proposed ordinance. But the one that really jumped out to me is that the blight review board would be consisting entirely of senior town employees. This means that if the blight officer thinks your roof is sagging, and he thinks, in his view, 
that it's dangerous, that's a potential violation of section 2D1I, or there's a crack in your stone foundation, another potential violation, then you go before the Blight Review Board where your fate, potentially $100 a day, is decided by those senior town employees, the town administrator, the chief of police, the health commissioner, et cetera, who are all unlikely to have expertise in that area. Also, I, I don't understand, are they gonna meet during the day when they should be dealing with law enforcement and now bicycle maintenance? I'm sorry? And in the case of the health commissioner, the uh, COVID issue, or are we gonna compel them to attend evening meetings outside their areas of expertise? The point being the review board should consist of residents, some of whom can be expected to have expertise in structural engineering and construction, nominated by the board of selectmen and confirmed by the RTM, like almost all our other boards and commissions. So we're referring this back, will enable that change as well as the other necessary changes pointed out by Mr. Spilo and Leonard and also Dr. Carlson. Thank you. Michelle Richardson to be followed by Michael Spilo. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, thank you to everyone on the phone. Um, I strongly urge an approval on the blight ordinance to move forward. Um, I am also a neighbor on the other side of the house on Hobart Avenue, and this home has been empty, as Laura mentioned, for the past decade. Um, and I've reached out to the town several times regarding the state of decay. Um, I have felt such embarrassment as friends and family visit over the years and ask why the town allows it to stay as it is in such an affluent town. Um, I have reviewed the ordinance and I feel that it is very fair to owners as well as neighbors. And I strongly urge this to move forward and continue and to find some resolution for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Spilo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, fellow RTM members and guests. I'm in favor of the ordinance, but I feel this one needs more work. I understand this has been pending since September and while the subcommittee had their first meeting in November, they have put a lot of time and effort into it. And I thank them for that. I also sympathize with the affected residents and with Mr. Camilla's desire to keep his campaign promise to redevelop the um, Byram Waterfront front. and I understand uh, Mr. Camillo feels this will help him with uncooperative property owners, but I believe we need to take the time to get this right and that involves careful consideration. Since the ordinance surfaced, I and several others have tried on a number of occasions to discuss substantive issues with members of the subcommittee and with Mr. Camillo and uh, including at the public works meeting. Several of the members of the subcommittee seemed open to feedback as did the town attorneys. But when it came to implement implementing changes, nothing happened. The pushback was always the same. The subcommittee claimed they had already considered the, and addressed the issue and claimed that, their, that the concerns were unfounded or that they had researched the issue and uh, picked the best solutions. But they addressed the issues which concerned them and they use the solutions which they considered best and the results of the opinions of this group of five volunteers guided by town attorneys who were being pressured by Mr. Camillo to get this done. Public Works provided a list of specific issues and I personally and others reached to try and get these implemented and were rebuffed. We can go through the 12 amendments on the floor, 12 proposed amendments on the floor, but this is not the best way to address these concerns, which were simply rejected by the subcommittee. Voting on a motion to refer would be signaling that the subcommittee should rethink. Blight ordinances have come into fashion uh, and have been used in Chicago and Detroit to dispossess urban poor. Greenwich is not Detroit. More locally, the blight officer in New Canaan said the complaints were often baseless. While we have blighted properties and need tools to deal with them, we also need to avoid the pitfall of having this ordinance misused. 
There is no urgency and we can take the necessary time and changes which will make this better, kinder ordinance for all Greenwich residents. An example is a right of property emailed to us by Mr. Carletti and his two neighbors who live on the same street in District 10. The property mentioned is across south of the Merritt, a mile away by road, and the nearest of the neighbors have several acres plus the Merritt Parkway and the Byron River as buffers. This, I would say this disqualified the complaint, but in addition, several of these, one of these homes is listed at over 40% of its assessed tax value. That's good news to, for Greenwich that properties are selling well, but this is our first example of people complaining on a non-neighbor. I've contacted the owners of that property and can share with you that the owners are residents, local residents who have run into some difficulties. They have, the, have had the property on the market for years. And though they have a buyer now, there are liens which make legal issues difficulty, difficult. The, the owners are older, but their extenuant circumstances don't include being below poverty, nor do they feel they require social services. Owners like these, like you and I, might encounter sympathetic, sympathetic town officials or they might not. And we should consider both possibilities in the ordinance. I and others believe this ordinance has merit and we can make it work. We hope that once we refer it back to the subcommittee, they will be more open to working with others on the RTM to make changes and make this better. Changes are needed to clarify the definition and provide some oversight and more time for homeowners to respond in the worst case. Please join me and fellow RTM members in supporting the motion to, to refer. Thank you. All right, we did discover a name that had signed up that for some reason didn't make the list. That is Rachel Kahana. So Rachel Kahana is now recognized speaking on the motion to refer. Um, also, uh, Aaron Leonard would like to speak from District 12. All right, a lot of people would like to speak. Our problem is it's almost 11 o'clock. We go by a sign-up list, and we're, we're not opening this up to the floor. We, we have to know what we're dealing with. That's why, we, that's why we ask for everyone interested to sign up. He's on regular. He's on, uh, yes, Aaron Leonard is on the list for the merits, but um, this is just speaking on the motion to refer, which does not include addressing the merits of the item. So the only- Wait, you'd like to speak on this also, but it's up to you. So Rachel Kahana is recognized to speak on the motion to refer. Are you there? Is Rachel Kahana there? Can we unmute Rachel Kahana? All right, Susan Kahana has been unmuted. Is Susan Kahana there? All right, um, if, if we cannot, who was speaking before? And then we lost somebody. All right, so that is it on the motion to refer. Will the district tabulators, now, if you are in favor of referring item two back to the special committee, you would vote yes huh? on the, on this motion to refer. If you are opposed to it and want to continue discussing item two tonight, we know there's a, a motion to amend coming from legislative and rules and we uh, could proceed to vote on the merits. So right now it is just, should we refer item two back to the special committee? If you are in favor, vote yes. If you are opposed, vote no. We we'll need to know the result of this vote before proceeding further.
All right, we have we have the result on the public works committee motion to refer. Those in favor of referring 80, opposed 131, abstaining zero. That motion to refer has failed. Mr. Bergweger. Yes, sir. Um, you have a motion to amend? I, I have a motion to make. Um, Get my paper there. On behalf of the uh, Legislative and Rules Committee, I move to amend the proposed blight ordinance to require a unanimous vote of the Board of Selectmen to appoint the blight officer. And I sent in the form, it should be on the screen. But basically, what we would do is in section uh, in section XX-2B, which is in definitions, it says the blight officer shall mean the person or persons or an authorized representative appointed by, new words, the unanimous vote of the board of selectmen and, end of words, reporting to the first selectman in charge with the identification and abatement of the blighted premises as authorized by this chapter. All right, that being, <laughs> that being a motion offered on behalf of one of our committees, it does not require a second. All right, um, we had no one signed up to speak on this. Is there anyone, uh, Mr. Bergweger, did you care to say anything further on this? Uh, no, not really. All right, is there anyone else interested in speaking on this motion to require the blight officer to be selected by unanimous vote of the Board of Selectmen? Mr. Oz is mayor. Um, thank you, uh, moderator. I, I'm not really, I wasn't really aware that this was gonna come before the RTM. And to me, it's a pretty material issue. And I suppose what I would ask is that this, this really shouldn't be in order because frankly, this is very late. We've been going on about this issue for a while. and. I, I'm just not sure the committees and the RTM really have the information need to make a decision like this. Thank you very much. Mr. Oz is mayor. This was adopted by the legislative and rules committee on Monday and was reported to all, all districts and committees. Further discussion on the legislative and rules committee motion to amend. Carl Carlson. Mr. Moderator, can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Moderator and fellow members of the RTM, in this, <coughs> in this dark period for democracy, anything that democratizes is good. That you have three people choose or are involved in choosing the blight officer is only good. It's for the good of everything to involve more people and to open things up. I recommend we strongly vote for this motion. But democracy is ruled by the majority. This would allow one person to uh, defeat something. Further discussion on the motion to amend. I hear nothing. Will the district chairs please mark your voting cards. Legislative and Rules Committee motion to amend. This adds a provision that the blight officer would be selected by a unanimous vote of the Board of Selectmen. And pr proceed to pull your delegation. We'll have to wait five minutes. We have the result of the vote on the Legislative and Rules motion to amend. Item two, those in favor, 81, opposed 120, abstaining three. That motion to amend has failed. All right, Mr. Spilo has indicated he has individual motions to amend. Mr. Spilo. Yes, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to start with a motion to amend uh, to remove section 21. 
the reasoning behind this is that current state and uh, federal and local emergency powers are sufficient to deal with any known emergency condition. We don't need an emergency declaration of blight or related precipitous actions. All right, now I understand there is a second to that. Mr. Dodson has seconded this motion. All right, so the Spilo motion is to remove section 21, which is entitled emergencies in its entirety. Pardon me? All right. Discussion on this motion to remove section 21 from the draft ordinance. Mr. Spilo, you've said your piece, correct? I can add that uh, I think this is uh, heavily overreaching and um, I, I can't imagine a circumstance and I'd be happy to have that discussion of in which uh, blight is an emergency situation that isn't covered by fire emergency, health emergency, uh, weather emergency, or, or other existing emergency conditions that, that you know, could, be, could be called on. Further discussion on the Spilo motion to amend item two. If you want to speak, you may raise your hand on this. I encourage you to work with your district representative who can call out as a panelist. We did not have speaker sign up lists for this, so Scott Kalb. Hello. Um, yes, just checking. Can you hear me, Mr. Moderator? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Um, just speaking from um, the subcommittee perspective, uh, we note that Section 21 is standard in blight ordinances throughout the state. Um, this language was not made up by the subcommittee. Um, it was advised to be included by the town attorneys. And the, um, we're not familiar with the, the emergency powers being cited uh, by uh, Mr. Spilo that could possibly substitute for this particular case. And finally, um, what we believe is there are situations that could arise where, for example, when looking at blight, uh, the, uh, the uh, blight review board or the blight officer could find that uh, there might be somebody who was infirm living in a blighted property who needs emergency assistance as a result of the blight investigation. And rather than having to go through the blight investigation, if they need to, they should be able to immediately remedy the situation. Also, you could have a physical structure, for example, a chimney separating from a house which might threaten to fall and actually not damage not only the existing property, but an adjacent property. Again, if that's a situation that's deemed to be an emergency, there should be a power to be able to go and act immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna Swamley, District 10. Thank you. Uh, this is a serious problem that has plagued the town for so, so many years. It's high time the town addressed this. This is a well-considered ordinance. I urge this body to reject this piecemeal attempt to amend and amend and amend this ordinance. Thank you. Henry Orfus, District 7. Hello, I support the Spilo Amendment for the reasons that Mike described. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Catherine. Yes, Catherine LaBalba, go ahead. Um, so um, looking at this, I, I believe that um, in an emergency situation, should they go out there and find structural defect and imminent collapse of the structure that could cause danger to either the occupants or neighbors, there might be a question of liability if the town has come out and seen it and failed to act. 
uh, I would caution against removing action in a case of imminent emergency as it might open us up to liability. Um, that something visibly standing up may not stand up uh, or continue to stand up once uh, the town officials come out there or the blight ordinances come out there. We wanna leave us with the ability to, to act. And Further discussion on the Spilo Amendment. Aaron Leonard, District 12. Good evening. Uh, just looking at that section, uh, I don't wish to put words in Mr. Spilo's mouth, but perhaps the overreach he's referring to is just the first sentence that reads any member. So although it is an eight member board, uh, this emergency action would only require the decision of a single member. That seems somewhat rash to me, but that is my opinion. Thank you. Seth Bacon to be followed by Adam Brodsky. Mr. Speaker, can I, and I apologize if I missed this earlier, how many amendments does Mr. Spilo have and is it possible to make a motion to combine them and take them all at once? Well, I've spoken to him about that. He wants to do them one by one. We can, you know, I, can the, I can said, the body, can the body overrule I, I, that? I, I, I encouraged him, you know, to be flexible based on whatever the result of the vote on the first one is. Our other option is a motion uh, for the previous question. So let's just deal with this right now. Do you have anything to say on this particular motion to amend? No, sir, thank you. Adam Brodsky. Hi, good evening, members of the RTM. Um, I was one of the members of the Blight Subcommittee, and I just wanna refresh uh, the recollection of the members of the RTM that the BRB or the Blight Review Board is made up of the town administrator, the fire chief, the, the police chief, the building official, which is the building inspector, the commissioner of human services, the health director, director of planning and zoning, the fire marshal or their designee. And as such, any of those members, uh, you know, being public uh, officials who work in the town, have a fiduciary obligation to ensure the health and well-being of the residents of the town of Greenwich. Um, as part of their investigation into the blight situation, if something is discovered in the realm of a, a building deficiency or a, or, or, or a resident who is, uh, has, uh, is in jeopardy, personal jeopardy or personal harm, they have an obligation to do that. And the rationale behind this provision is to empower them or allow them to uh, obviously see that, uh, you know, pursue their role in, as a town official and make sure that for the health and well-being of the citizens. So that's the rationale. And, and so the committee fully supports it. All right. <clears throat> Will the uh, district chairs please mark your voting cards. Spilo motion to amend item two, removal of section 21. If you want to take that section out you vote yes this is just on the motion to amend not on the ordinance on the merits if you want to remove that section you vote yes on this motion if you want to leave it in you vote no so we'll await the result of this and figure out where we are All right, we have the result of the vote on the Spilo motion. Those in favor, 48, opposed, 147, abstaining, four. That motion has failed. Mr. Spilo will not be offering anything further. Now, um, I would call for discussion on item two. We did have a speaker list. Um, I could also call for the vote right now. Um, so I'll, I'll just run through this list. Uh, Bob McKnight, to be followed by Samarpana Tam. This is speaking on item two on the merits. Can you put your hand up? Bob McKnight. Yes, Tom. You want to speak on this item? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, many of you know from our local media that Byram was plagued with a blighted property for many years, one of many in our district. Greenwich's weak nuisance ordinance and a lack of a local blight ordinance provided little relief to neighbors facing problems from animal and rodent concerns. 
This problematic property provided an attractive nuisance to our youth, not to mention possible structure insecurity and a fire hazard in a heavily congested area. A subcommittee of our Byram Neighborhood Association chaired by Lucy Von Brockel attracted many other like-minded citizens from other districts with concerns for similar situa situations along with our state representative, Steve Meskers. Our goal was to get relief for residents suffering from blighted properties in their neighborhood to rectify longstanding problems. With the help of many, including the Selectman's Office and other town departments with concerns over nuisance issues, this ordinance offers our town, which has a history and reputation for well-kept properties, to provide the town with more of an ability to identify and declare a property subject to this ordinance, a timely redress of grievances. This ordinance, as written, is a good start. Kudos to the work of this committee. Thank you. All right, thank you. Sam Arpana, Tam, to be followed by Aaron Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sam Arpana, Tam, District 4 here. The Blight Ordinance addresses dilapidated, blighted, rat-infested structures in a very compassionate manner, which will protect the health, safety, and welfare of all of the residents of the town. The needs of the blighted property owner are handled with special consideration and care. The ordinance, section nine, special consideration, may grant an owner occupant additional time to correct a violation. An elderly individual who is unable to personally correct a violation, a disabled individual who is unable to correct a violation due to his or her disability, a low income individual who cannot maintain the property. A blighted property owner or occupant shall be considered disabled if they have a mental or physical disability as defined under the American Disabilities Act. Property owners will be considered low income if their gross income is equal to or less than 150% of the poverty line. The purpose of the ordinance is not to terrorize, evict, or confiscate blighted property from their owners. No, the owner tenant may be elderly, have serious health issues, mental health issues, and have been isolated over many years. Residents of blighted properties are living in unhealthy, dangerous conditions, which are harmful to themselves and others. None of us want to see our neighbors living under these awful condition. It is only humane and compassionate to help. The heads of the Department of Health and Hum of Human Services and the Department of Health are sitting on the Blight Review Board. They have the knowledge, resources, and capacity to help those residents living in dilapidated, dangerous, blighted properties. Thank you these very much. Time is up. Sam, um, Aaron Leonard to be followed by Michael Spilo. Good evening. I will just say that I'm not speaking against the blight ordinance. Before living in Greenwich, we lived in Stanford with a very uh, difficult neighbor next door. So I am very sympathetic to these blight ordinances. Uh, like other speakers, it's not against an ordinance, but that this ordinance needs some modification. Uh, for example, the definitions of what is blight include determinations made by four of the same individuals who are on the eight member board. I don't see how that is in a conflict for those board members to make a determination whether it's a violation based on something that they've already determined was a blight. Uh, additionally, under same under definitions, there's a hyphen it for owner and occupant. While often an owner and occupant may be the same individual, there are many instances where they are not. Uh, a renter and a property owner are entirely different uh, standing legally. You cannot ask a renter to make remedies to a property they do not own. Further, I don't know what their incentive would be seeing as the ultimate penalty would be a lien on a property that doesn't belong to them. Uh, in the notice of continuing violations, there's discussion of timing, which is also problematic because there are two times, time to begin and time to finish. This creates unnecessary confusion. All of this is to say, as a previous speaker said, 
this is a good start and it is and it should move forward but it needs to move forward after some adjustments have been made thank you very much all right um mr spilo has passed uh bill lewis did you have did you have something yes i do thank you um Believe it or not, I'd like to propose an amendment um, consistent with what I said earlier and with what was discussed at the Legislative and Rules Committee meeting, <clears throat> namely that the review board should consist of residents like all our other boards and commissions and not of senior town employees. As it stands now, the blight officer and the hearing officer would be appointed solely by the first selectman and the review board members would all essentially report to the first selectman. I just think that's too large and too unhealthy a concentration of power in one person on such a sensitive, subjective subject, no matter how competent or decent that person might be. So uh, the um, uh, amendment is simple. It's just two sentences replacing section two in part E where the Blight Review Board is defined. I, I would propose changing it to simply say the Blight Review Board shall consist of eight town residents nominated by the Board of Selectmen and appointed by the RTM. Their term of office shall be four years, except the first four members appointed shall have an initial term of two years. Uh, so they- All right, we're gonna, we do have a slide for that. We're, we're gonna put, put that up. All right, Mr. Lewis, does that uh, encompass your motion? Yes, sir. All right, is there a second? It has been moved and seconded to amend as described by Mr. Lewis. That is currently before us. Discussion. So this has to do with the appointment, nomination and appointment of the Blight Review Board. Discussion on that motion to amend. Lucy Von Brockle to be followed by Adam Brodsky. Hi, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I just wanna point out that um, many of our town codes are enforced by town employees, one usually. Um, the health code is enforced by the director of health. The building code is enforced by the, the building officer. Our zoning regulations are enforced by zoning enforcement officers. Our nuisance code is, is enforced by nuisance abatement officers. This board's job is just to determine whether blight exists. That is not a job for civilians. It's a job for the people that are experts in code enforcement and the codes that, that relate to blight. Thank you. Adam Brodsky. Um, Again, um, as I said earlier, you know, the Blight Review Board is made up of the town administrator, the chief of police, the building official, the fire chief, the commissioner of health and human services, the health director, director of PNZ, and the fire marshal. And these blight issues deal with not only, you know, a dilapidated structure potentially, but, you know, there are, there are issues with endangering first responders, there's issues with um, uh, mental infirmity, and uh, coordination of various town services. So although uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the, the amendment is well-intentioned, the, there is no way that a, a, uh, a member of the RTM or a town resident could fill the shoes of any of these individuals or on the Blight Review Board. These people are professional people who are, are, who are well-versed in, in all the various areas in which they, they, they practice and uh, it's, they're not equivalent. So uh, uh, that was the rationale behind the Blight Committee, and that's why we chose the Blight Review Board and formulated it as we did. Scott Kalb, be followed by Carl Carlson. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, just to say first that this we've responded to this issue in our written comments that have been circulated to all members of the RTM. Encourage you to look at it. Um, and just to mention that we have discussed this with our town attorneys, there is no case of any blight ordinance in the state where you've got um, civilians who are actually uh, making decisions about blight on their neighbors' uh, properties. Our town attorney advised us that this is a terrible idea. Uh, we also suggest that 
um, that our town officials who are all expert in their field, one of the reasons why you wanna have them on the blood review board is because they can also make a determination when something can be handled through other codes that they are responsible for so that they don't have to determine blight. So you want them there to determine blight. Also, you want them there to determine when there is no blight. Um, and they also are acting every day in uh, determining violations and in moving forward on, uh, on uh, town incidents using municipal powers that are granted to them under state statute, just the same as this would be under a blight ordinance. So we urge people to reject this amendment. Thank you. Carl Carlson to be followed by Jude Collins. Mr. Moderator, members of the RTM, I'm in my 30th year in RTM and I'm in my 25th of RTC. I've seen a lot. And I tell you, if you have eight residents, you have a better chance of justice any day of the week and any time than you would up with officials. Go with the democracy. The democracy is clean and good for this country. I urge the people who believe in Greenwich to vote for Mr. Lewis's motion. Jude Collins. I'd like to call the question, please. Is there a second? Second, Catherine LaBalbo. All right. It has been moved and seconded to immediately cut off debate and proceed to vote on Mr. Lewis's motion to amend. I will alert you before calling for the vote that there are others who have indicated, or at least one other who has indicated a desire to speak, and that's our first selectman. Um, I'm going to, in the first instance, uh, call for a raised hand vote. And um, if it's, you know, we need a two thirds majority, we need a two thirds vote for this to pass. Um, so all hands down, only members are voting. If you want to immediately proceed to vote on the Lewis Amendment, you vote yes. If you want to hear further discussion on this amendment, you vote no. All those in favor of uh, the previous question, please signify, please raise your hand. <laughs> all right thank you all hands down that's about 115 all those um, who would like to hear further discussion on the motion to amend please raise your hand About 20. All right, the motion for the previous question has carried. Will the district tabulators please mark your voting cards? Lewis motion to amend item two and please proceed to pull your delegation as Mr. quickly as possible. Mr. Moderator, what section is being amended? Section 2E. All right, um, so do we have that slide up? Yep. All right, I can't see it right now. What is the section? Section 2E, and the this is the appointment of the Blight Review Board to uh, cause it to be filled by nomination and then appointment, I guess, nomination by the selectman, the first selectman, and uh, appointment by the RTM. I don't know if it's board of selectmen or selectman nominating. All right, we are still waiting. It was district six and one we're waiting for. Just district six. Just district six? All right, but the vote is, is uh, apparent that this motion will fail. So I will report the official vote when it is finalized, but um, we're going, we, we need to continue here. Mr. Um, Moderator, can, can I, can I put, just cause it's getting so late. Can I call the previous, make a motion to call the previous question and, and bring this to a vote? No. No, I'm calling for a vote on item number two. Will okay. the district tabulators please mark your voting cards? Item number two, 
and proceed to poll your delegation. If you are in favor of this blight ordinance, you vote yes. If you are opposed to it, you vote no. Hang on, we need to find a slide, okay? No, no, up, 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 up. Amendment. Item two, go down, get rid of as amended. Just say item two, no as amended. No as amended because there was nothing to pass. There was an amendment by legislative rules. Did that pass? Did that, did that, the LNR one didn't pass. It was 81 to 120. Well, I don't see the unanimous at that. So that's good. All right, we have we have the final vote on the Lewis motion to amend item two. Those in favor, fifty six. Opposed, one thirty three. Abstaining, three. That motion to amend has failed. We are currently voting on item two. Um, we do not need to await the result of this vote. That's a vote on the merits. We will proceed with our next item, which is item number four. Um, he did. We're voting on item two. All right, who's presenting item number four? I am Mr. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move to adjourn. <laughs> I don't recognize that. Who Who's presenting item number four? Uh, I am Mr. Moderator, Kip Bergweger, Chair of All right. Bergweger, Legislative, and Rules. Legislative and Rules Committee. Mr. Bergweger. Uh, item four, resolved that the ordinance entitled chap Excuse me, excuse me, what? You, you need five minutes to vote for item two. Oh my goodness. I thought we were back at central. Oh my goodness. Five minutes. We gotta wait five minutes. Mr. Moderator, give notice that I would like to move to adjourn when we get the vote back. Okay, well, you have to be recognized, and you're not. <laughs> you turn that down for a moment. All right, so those of us gathered here in uh, what should we describe this as in base camp um, have discussed where we are, what is remaining to be done. And item four, although there were many speakers, it seems to be a essentially a consent item to uh, pull the sunset provision. Um, and item 16, according to the chair of district nine, is likely to be referred back to district nine. So neither should take us much time. And a suggestion was made by uh, the leadership gathered here that we should um, probably be able to finish up by 1230. So we do have an option. We can try and plow through those two. We could postpone them to our next meeting. Um, and so those are the options. And if you could, uh, while we're tabulating the vote on item two, um, let your district rep know what your preference is. Um, you know, we'll- Mr. Moderator, item 16 is a first read. So if we delay it, to, if we postpone it to the next meeting, will it come back as a first read or a second read at the next meeting? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, we have, our committees have looked at it um, and perhaps keeping that in mind, we probably should take some action unless we wanna condemn ourselves to take it up as a first read, you know, I guess literally you could say that if we don't do anything tonight. I don't know, I'd have to think about that. Any other, among our panelists, any other thoughts? Correct, if we refer it to District 9, it comes back as a second read. Which is not to say we have to vote, take a final vote that second time, but. That would be my ruling on. Any other thoughts among panelists? Park and Rec motion to refer. I'm sorry, Catherine Lababa. The Park and Rec motion to refer to education. 
Well, if so, I would I would call for the um, public works motion to refer back to District Nine, and if that failed, then I would recognize the Parks and Rec motion. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts on what we should do at this point? We're still waiting for the vote. Is that right? I'm getting feedback from District 11. They want to continue on All from right. some, members, I, I, some members of District 11, but I'll say. All right. So um, let's try and do that. But, you know, with the understanding that the 23 people who signed up on District for Item 4, we really don't need to hear all of that. There were no descending votes. All right. So has the five minutes expired? All right. So item four now is before us, uh, Kip Bergweger. Uh, uh, resolved that the ordinance entitled Chapter 9, Waste and Litter, Article 4, Reusable Checkout Bag of the Code of Ordinances of the Town of Greenwich is hereby amended by deleting Section 9-38. It is, is as it appears in the call. All right. That is now currently before us, coming from one of our own committees. May we have the reports of the committees, Mr. Bergweger? Uh, the reusable checkout bag ordinance has a sunset clause pursuant to which the ordinance will expire on September 12 of this year. Legislative and Rules Committee held a special meeting on February 11 to consider the request of some of our constituents to delete or extend the sunset clause. Prior to this special meeting, the Legislative and Rules Committee received letters from the Greenwich Sustainability Committee and the Office of the First Selectman supporting the indefinite extension of the ordinance. At the special meeting, Douglas Wells, the previous and eminent chair of LNR, Janine Bear Getz, a member of BYO Greenwich, the organization that had sponsored the ordinance originally, and Pat Sesto, the director of the town's environmental affairs, spoke in favor of deleting the sunset clause. Among the reasons given for supporting an indefinite extension were the following. Within the first nine months of the ordinance's adoption, the town's merchants and other businesses had adjusted to the requirements of the ordinance. And since then, there have been no difficulties or objections. The cost of waste disposal has been increasing and will continue to increase. And the limitations on the use of plastic bags will reduce the cost of waste disposal. If the town does not extend the ordinance, it will become subject to the state law and is better to retain town control over our reusable bags. Greenwich was the second new municipality in Connecticut to adopt such an ordinance, and we have been a leader for other communities in the state. You also notice that the absence of plastic bags at the beach or blowing across empty parking lots has become quite noticeable. At the special meeting, the Legislative Rules Committee voted 12-0-0 in favor of deleting the sunset clause. We did not take a vote at our March meeting, and at the appropriate time, I will make a motion approved by District 8 to waive the second reading rule as it applies to item four. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Berg with the Land Use Committee report. Good evening again. We had uh, Doug Wells and Erling Searle from BYOB Greenwich and Pat Sesto, for, Director of Environmental Affairs. Um, the uh, concerns over this plastic bag regulation were never realized. Ms. Sesto explained that initially there were approximately 18 vendors that uh, uh, sought relief from the ordinance. The Conservation Commission worked with them to resolve issues. Since then, the amount of work required to enforce the ordinance has been minimal. No fines have been levied. Ms. Sesto noted a large quantity of plastic bags have been diverted from the waste stream, perhaps a million uh, bags annually from our uh, larger supermarkets and stores. Um, addressing the difference between the state regulation, which is newer than our town regulation, uh, and our town regulation, Ms. Sesto explained that our, our ordinance requires that paper bags offered to customers must have a minimum post-consumer content in them, which, uh, which helps to further close the loop on recycling. The state law does not, does not have such a requirement. 
The land use committee vote on this item was 12 in favor, none opposed, uh, in favor of the amendment as it appears on the call. Michael Spilo with the Public Works Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Public Works met with Conservation Director Sesto, BYO members Be uh, Getz, Bear, and Wells. Uh, we were informed that the bag ordinance was successful and that it pushed the state to implement a statewide ban, which will become effective July 1. Proponents were concerned that the state may reverse the ban. They pointed to declining revenues and were concerned this would cause the state to try and continue to collect bag fees. Proponents also favored local regulation, which includes specific requirements for paper bags and for reusable bags. Opponents noted that there was no reason for the state to reverse itself and that the bag revenues declined because all major chains, including CVS, Walgreens, Acme, Whole Foods, Stop and Shop, and ShopRite, had stopped offering plastic bags statewide. Opponents also noted that all but Whole Foods also charged for paper bags, which is not required by Greenwich's ordinance, but allowed by the state. Opponents noted that the local ordinances with minor adjustments cause confusion, which make it more difficult to start and expand businesses in the state. Lastly, it was pointed out that the Greenwich ordinance contains a 12 mil requirement for reusable bags, uh, <clears throat> which is not met by any, any of the widely available reusable bags. And the ordinance requirement for post-consumer recycled content is not science-based and conflicts with EPA recommendations and the requirements in most other states. Uh, Public Works voted 9-2-0 in favor of the item with opponents noting the conflicts and issues above I mentioned. All right, thank you. Mr. Bergweger. <clears throat> yes, sir. You wanna make my motion? Yes. Uh, on behalf of District 8, I move to waive, waive the second reading rule as it applies to item four. All right, and pursuant to our rule, if there is a two thirds vote in favor of that, we could take a final vote on this tonight. Discussion on the District 8 motion to, I'm sorry, I, I heard it was a District 8 motion. Is it a district motion or an individual motion? It's a district motion, District 8. Discussion on the District 8 motion to uh, take a final vote on item four tonight. Is there anyone who would like to be heard on that? Uh, I would, your, Mr. Moderator. Go ahead. Um, I urge people um, not to vote for this. I think given the late hour, the number of people who have left and the fact that this is a change to the town rules, um, that we should have further consideration of this. So I do not think we should dispose of it this evening without a second. Further discussion on this District 8 motion to take a final vote tonight. Who? Allison Walsh. Pat Sesto after Allison Walsh. Uh, I don't think I, I signed up to speak on this, but I would support waiving the second read rule because. All right, we're, we're, we're apparently looking for raised hands. No one signed up to speak on this. Pat Sesto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I had uh, raised my hand in anticipation to speaking on the um, proposal. Uh, I have nothing to say with regards to the, the second read. Um, did you want to speak on this? So did you want to speak on this District 8 motion? Not this on the District 8 goal. motion, no. All right, Jude Collins. I'd like to move the question. All right, the question before us is, should we suspend our rules, the second read rule, so that uh, we do not have to bring this back at another meeting before we can take a final vote? If you are in favor of immediately proceeding to that vote. So this is a motion for the previous question, um, which requires itself a two thirds majority to pass. 
And given the hour, I am prepared in the first instance to call for a raised hand vote on Mr. Collins' motion for the previous question. So if you are in favor of immediately proceeding to take a vote on the District 8 motion, then you should vote yes or raise your hand when I call for those in favor. If you want to have further discussion on the District 8 motion, you should vote no. All those in favor of cutting off debate on the District 8 motion to suspend the rules, please raise your hand. So I get a, what, about a 123? All right, hands down. Those, those who are opposed to immediately proceeding to vote on the District 8 motion, raise your hand. All right, we're, that's under 30. So that motion has carried. Um, I'm going to call for a raised hand vote on this motion to suspend the rules. It requires a two thirds vote. If it's anywhere near close, we'll take a record vote. Let's see what it is with the raised hand vote. So um, what we are now voting on is to, if you, we're voting on the motion to suspend the rules to allow us to take a final vote on item four tonight. If you are in favor of suspending the second read rule, you will raise your hand when I call for those in favor. If you want this to come back at a, another meeting, you would vote no when I call for that vote. All those in favor of suspending the second read rule for item four, please raise your hand now. All right, I see about 116. Hands down. Those who oppose suspending the second read rule, please raise your hands now. All right, so I have about 49. All right, so I had a total of 165 votes. Um, two thirds would be 110, we had 116. So based on that, I would say that the motion is passed. Is there anyone who wants to call for a record vote? I'm not hearing, <clears throat> I am not hearing any. All right, so the second read rule has been suspended for item four. We are now um, able to take a final vote. I will ask, I, I have a list of 23 speakers. Um, oh, I know, uh, first selectman wanted to speak, right? Is Mr. Camillo with us? We just called a question. Well, I want to give the first selectman an opportunity. Mr. Camillo, are you with us? Yes, I just got back on. Um, yeah, this is the uh, the bag ordinance. Um, this is the bag ordinance, and we are going to take a final yeah. vote on it tonight. Yeah, I just wanted to say that thank everybody that worked on it. And um, in the past, you know, when this first came up several years ago, I was supportive, but I thought we had we could order offer some. Uh, uh, amendments to ease into it, but in the in the few years that's been on you know on the books, it's it's worked well. And now with the uh, problems we face with uh, waste disposal costs, and now having to pay for recycling, I think anything we can get out of the waste stream is a good thing. Um, so, and I know uh, in speaking to a lot of people around town, um, that seems to be a, a, a feeling uh, that I get, and that people are very supportive of it. So it's been working. We learned how to to do without them. 
and certainly, uh, like I said, getting anything out of the waste stream, and we're working on that right now on some other things, uh, is a good thing. So again, to all that worked on this, uh, thank you. And uh, to all who hung out, hung out all night, uh, thank you for all your work. All right, is there anyone else who would like to speak on the merits of item two? Uh, item four, I'm, I'm looking at the result of the vote on item two in front of me. Okay, on item four, any other interested speakers before I call for a final vote? Doug Wells. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, good morning. Um, I uh, just want to um, say that um, I urge the RTM not to consider the argument that I heard at some committee and district meetings that since there is now a state statute that prohibits plastic bags, we should just allow the ordinance to cease to exist. Um, the state statute only prohibits plastic bags of four mil in thickness. Our ordinance prohibits all plastic bags of less than 12 mil. So it provides a greater level of protection than the state statute would and um, would uh, ask, uh, the RTM to uh, vote in favor of deleting the provision that uh, calls for the sunset clause. Thank you. All right, are we ready for a final vote? We have more hands. What hands? Who? Pat Sesto. Thank you. Uh, I did want to expand further on the value of the Greenwich Ordinance over the state um, statute. The enforcement that we have in place now is at the local level. Uh, if enforcement were uh, left up to the state by deferring to their state statute, um, it is the de um, Department of Revenue Services that would uh, be in charge. And um, I feel pretty strongly that the amount of work that I would have to um, undertake in order to get the state to take action on an infraction um, would far exceed what I'm able to do directly. Um, I also find that um, determining what is compliant and not compliant as far as a bag goes would be far more difficult. Um, as just stated, the town ordinance is a 12 mil bag, which is hardly recognizable versus a four mil bag, which generally equates to twice the thickness of a freezer storage bag. Um, so determining what's a three mil or four mil would be uh, very difficult and we would lose out. The uh, town ordinance prohibits the distribution of um, takeaway bags, whether they are given away as part of a freebie or at a point of sale. The state is only at the point of sale, so we are much more efficient in that regard. Um, and I do want to note that we have the support of local ordinance from our own Chamber of Commerce and the uh, Kinetic Food Association, which represents 300 food retailers and 175 pharmacies, which all support local um, ordinance associated with uh, bag bans. Thank you. Janine Bear Getz, be followed by Jude Collins. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And I want to thank the RTM and uh, guests who were speaking tonight. Um, just to add to um, what Pat Sesto and First Selectman Camillo have said, um, this has been a community effort. It's been well received. And uh, in addition to the statements that have already been made as far as waste reduction, further waste reduction, compliance, no fines have been issued. And uh, local ordinances give us greater control over our own destiny for our town. And also that I want to add that there was no additional cost um, re regarding this ordinance to the town, um, to the department budget. So that's it. And thank you very much again for your consideration. Moderator, can we call the question, please? Who just spoke? Yeah, Mr. Rose's mayor. That's Mr. Collins's job. Okay, thank you. I'd like to call the question, please. All right. So I will. <clears throat> I will use my. I will use my discretion, and I'm going to call for the vote. Will the district chairs please mark? This is now a final vote on the merits of item number four. Will the district chairs please mark your voting cards? Item number four. 
proceed to pull your delegation. We have one final item, but I'm told we have to wait five minutes. Mr. Moderator, do you have the results from number item number two? Yes, I do. Uh, this is the blight ordinance. Those in favor, 146. Opposed, 38. Abstaining, 7. Item number two has carried. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. All right, so that's the end of the five minutes. Uh, we don't have the final vote, but we can continue now to the final item on our agenda, which is item 16. And District 9 informs me they have a substitute resolution. Betsy Fruman, Chair of District 9. Hi, the substitute resolution proposed by District 9 adds one more sentence to the end of the resolution as it appears in the call. And the sentence is, upon petition by the Board of Education, unless otherwise prohibited by applicable law, the Planning and Zoning Commission may, upon majority vote, waive the application of this provision to a project. <clears throat> All right. Um, is Amina Ahmad with us still? All right. Yes, so, Mr. Moderator. All right. So I, I'm going to summarize things and ask you um, if it's an accurate summary. So this, by its terms, the substitute would delegate to planning and zoning a power that um, our, law, our law department has said planning and zoning is not authorized to um, exercise under state statute. Planning and zoning's authority comes from state statute, and it would not authorize um, them to exercise what this proposes to delegate to them. Is that an accurate summary? Yes, that is correct, Mr. Moderator. All right. So the law department, therefore, has said this substitute resolution is not in legal order. And when that occurs, the chair will not accept um, a proposal that is not in legal order. So. Um, this has all been communicated to District 9. They are not surprised by this. And uh, they then would like to present what was originally on the call. Is that correct, Ms. Fruman? Yes. All right, so it's now, you wanna go ahead and do that? Uh, item 16 is as it appears on the call. All right, um, may we have the reports of the committees that considered this? beginning with our education committee, Kimberly Blank, chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Betsy Fruman, chair of district nine presented this item to us with the help of additional members from district nine, including Abby Large and Seth Bacon, who are members of the education committee. We also heard from Peter Bernstein and Kathleen Stowe of the board of education and Michael Mason and Leslie Moriarty of the BET. Members of District 9 explained that they were considering amending this item to include language to limit the types of projects that would be included. Since we didn't have any amendment before us, we discussed this item as presented. Our committee voted not to recommend this item with a vote of 480. Those in favor said they believe that building committees will provide greater transparency and good governance for major construction projects, and that they believe the Board of Ed should be freed up to focus on educational issues. They think that building committees would likely lead to better and faster construction processes. Some said that they were in favor of the types of amendments to this item being discussed by District 9, such as the waiver process, to make sure that less significant process, projects aren't required to have building committees. Those opposed cited several reasons. While most appreciated the spirit of the proposal, which advocates for good governance and oversight, many spoke of unintended consequences of making this change. They are concerned that too many less significant projects will now require building committees, and this will put a strain on Board of Education members and staff, as well as community volunteers needed to serve on them. They wonder whether building committees will actually lead to slower construction times. They question the need for this, noting that in the past decades, the only major construction project that didn't otherwise have a building committee is Cardinal Stadium. They note that many of the concerns regarding reporting and transparency could easily be remedied by requesting regular reports from the Board of Ed, rather than by creating additional cumbersome building committees. 
Some question why this rule wouldn't also be required of major town projects, noting that the supervisors of town projects are town employees and don't have the objectivity, transparency, and community makeup that building committees have. Again, our vote was 480. Districts 3, 4, 9, and 12 voted in favor. Districts 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, and 11 voted against. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Berg of the Land Use Committee. <clears throat> so the Land Use Committee uh, had uh, Jane Weisbecker and Ann Jones as proponents. Joe Kelly is up opponent. Um, uh, bottom line, we voted 11-1-0 in favor of the amendment. District 2 voted no because she felt that the Board of Ed is fully capable of managing their own capital projects. Um, I think, it, I think uh, the, the pros and cons are pretty well known, so I'll just leave it with that. Kip Bergwager with legislative and rules report. Uh, we had a joint meeting with with land use and then moved on to a separate meeting. We were helped by Jane Arnone and Brian Rainey of District 9 and Joe Kelly of the Board of Education. Uh, they noted, they argued that major projects can benefit from oversight and accountability that a building committee can provide, as in giving Cardinal Stadium as an example. There are other projects that could need building committees, even if they don't receive state aid. Um, so they were proposing to extend it to federal aid or items that require one or more municipal improvements. Uh, just prior to our meeting, some of us had received an email which gave uh, alternative language and we knew that if since District 9 was planning to change it, we moved to amend this um, the uh, proposal, the, the provision to reflect the language that was in the email uh, and voted on that. And that was the vote to amend was 1200. Votes on legal order and the merits as amended were both 1200. And I think the principal difference between what we amended and what the board and what the um, current the rejected provision was that the um, we had that the board that the board of selectmen can waive the application rather than the uh, uh, planning and zoning commission. Thank you, Catherine Lababo, chair of our Parks and Recreation Committee. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Moderator and members of the RTM. The uh, Park and Rec Committee took this up on Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday evening. Uh, we were joined by Bessie Fruman from District 9, as well as Peter Bernstein and Dr. Jones from the Board of Ed um, and, and Education Department. Well, we discussed some pros and cons, namely that uh, Mr. Bernstein noted that uh, the Board of Ed can um, make a committee of its own choosing and it was considering such for the second phase of Cardinal Stadium um, that they, um, they discussed their desire for further involvement and uh, that they you know, wanted to be incorporated into the forming of uh, this change in the ordinance and uh, that they felt that um, they wanted to know why it wasn't really extended into uh, town capital projects as well as just focused on education uh, projects. The uh, District 9 noted that uh, this has something to do with the way the ordinance was originally proposed and to rewrite it to take out uh, the uh, specifying only education projects would require more of a rewrite, rewrite which they did not, um, were not looking to do. Um, a motion was made uh, based on, uh, you know, kind of the discussion uh, in the course that it took where the Board of Ed talked about its desire to uh, be more involved in the forming of this directive. Uh, a motion was made to refer the item to the RTM Education Committee. Um, that, that vote passed as 5-2 with four abstentions. Uh, the uh, later we took an item uh, vote on the item as it appeared on the call 
Um, although uh, District 9 did say that they were going to make some changes to the language, the vote as it was on the call was two, six with three abstentions. The abstentions largely due to the fact that delegates did not feel the language uh, was ready for a final vote. Thank you. All right, I, I had a different vote. Is that what you're asking, Mr. Spilo? Uh, no, I'm asking if that carries. Five, two, four? Yes. Five, two, four definitely carries. The, the abstentions are never counted. Okay. All right, um, and the Public Works Committee, Mr. Spilo. Uh, thank you. Public Works met with uh, uh, Ms. Fruman and Ms. Kordick from District 9. Um, and uh, they indicated the building committees were required for most projects by state law and that this was good governance idea which should be expanded. They indicated some difficulty in defining the language clearly and we were told that legislative, legislative and rules had a motion to amend and, the con and had concerns regarding the ability to issue a waiver of the requirement for a building committee. We also heard from Mr. Amundsen of our committee who has extensive experience on building committees having served on behalf of Public Works on MISA and who is, is currently serving on the High School Vestibule Building Committee. Mr. Amundsen indicated that he felt that the building committees were, did a, were thorough and did a good job and were able, to, were able to leverage the knowledge of their members. He expressed concern about the high level of commitment needed by those serving on building committees and felt it might may be difficult to recruit enough people to serve on an expanded list of projects. Public Works took two votes. The first was a motion to refer back to District 9 to fix the language regarding uh, waivers. The vote on this carried 10-01 with District 9 abstaining. The second vote was on the merits of the item. Uh, in other words, the idea of a building committee using building committees more broadly. The votes on the merits was 11-0-0. Thank you. All right, Mr. Spilo, you wanna offer your motion? Okay. Um, so public work moves to refer item four, no, item 16 back to district nine. All right, discussion on that motion. Betsy Fruman. You need to unmute. Uh, unmute, we cannot hear you. Is there anything on our end that we can do? No, no, she just... We can't hear you. Yeah, you're hitting the video button, not the microphone button. All right, um, try and work on that. Is there anyone else uh, who cares to speak on the motion to refer? My understanding is District 9 does not oppose this. Ms. Fruman, could you put your video on and just give me a thumbs up if that's true? Anyone from District 9 wanna? Oh, okay. So we have a confirmation that District 9 does not oppose and, and would like this referred back to them. Further discussion on the motion to refer? All right, I'm gonna call for a raised hand vote, this being a procedural issue. If you are in favor of referring item 16 and going home, then you should raise your hand when I call for the votes in support. If you would like to stay here further, you should raise your hand when I call for the opposition. All those in favor of referring this item 16 back to, item, uh, to district nine, please raise your hand.
All right, I see 122, hands down. Those who oppose the motion to refer, please raise your hands. All right, all right, hang on, hang on. We, we're gonna clear the board. We're gonna lower all hands. I have 120, 121 um, in favor of the motion. And now if you are opposed to referring this, please raise your hand. Okay, so that's eight. So this motion to refer has carried. Um, and it will be up to District 9 as to um, when that is brought back to us and in what form. Listen, I thank, I thank everyone, particularly Moderator, those. Could we, yes. have, could we have the vote on number four, please? Yes, hang on a minute. Sorry. All right, this is the uh, bag ordinance. Final vote, those in favor, 144, opposed 25, abstaining seven. Item four has carried. All right, once again, I wanna thank all those who came in and helped advise in person, uh, made for a uh, more enjoyable experience, and I thank you all. Um, I thank everyone else for remaining until this, the end of this meeting. Um, and until we meet again, um, thank you very much. This meeting stands adjourned. <laughs>